Chapter 141, Slow or Fast? The players participating in the Mercenary PvP tournament gathered at the square outside the Hall of Mercenaries entrance with 10 minutes left before 7 p.m. Official statement stated that a teleportation array would send these players into their respective PvP arenas. Players who had the participation was more important than the result mindset showed their high level of responsibility at this point and, as long as they were part of mercenary groups, made sure to participate in the PvP tournament. As such, the square was crowded with players like Can Sardines and even the many roads leading to the square were filled with people. The current scene naturally made the game company of Parallel World extremely exhilarated. At this moment, the game officials sent an emergency system announcement, with this being the first round of the Mercenary PvP tournament on the first day of the event. The amount of players participating has hit the maximum limit and exceeded our estimation. There will hereby be an extension to the time each player will take to enter his or her PvP arena. Can the players please hurry? The players, including the six members of Young Masters Elite Mercenary Group, voiced their complaints when they heard this. The six had gotten separated from one another on their way to this square. Gufei discovered that the crowd had somehow been divided based on the players' strength with the stronger ones being able to squeeze their way to the front and the weaker ones like himself naturally being pushed to the back of the line to wait for much longer. Before he knew it, all the players around him were now made up of weak mages that looked as if they could be killed with just a lift of a finger. Where are you guys? Throwing this question on the mercenary channel, Gufei saw that the other five men were also asking this same question. In the blink of an eye, it was already 7 p.m., Yet Gufei had not even advanced one step forward. It was at this point that the game officials finally permitted the players to enter their respective maps. The human traffic started to flow. The players within the square started disappearing one by one in bright lights as they went through the teleportation array, allowing the players at the back to move forward and take the vacated spaces in front. Ten minutes later, the system sent another announcement, due to the current special circumstance in this first round. There will not be any time limit to entering the maps. All players may take their time to enter the teleportation array, I'm in. The first one among Young Master's elite to arrive at the teleportation array was actually Young Master Han. How's that possible? Gufei exclaimed in shock. Logically speaking, war without wounds should get there first. It's seduction. Seduction. Royal God Call resolutely stated, making Gufei wonder if he had been the victim of seduction himself. Gufei went into deep thought. Given young Master Han's astonishingly beautiful looks, pretending to be a woman would be far too easy for him. He reckoned that the other players must have mistaken young Master Han as a beautiful lady and demonstrated their chivalrous spirit by effortlessly allowing him to afford of their lady's first practice. The opposing mercenary group seems to have finished with its preparation. Having entered the map, Young Master Han reported accordingly, it's just one man. This was not a rarity. Quite a number of players enjoyed playing the game by themselves, so quite a number of mercenary groups had only one member. Thus, bumping into this sort of mercenary groups in the first round was a common occurrence. The ensuing messages sent by Young Master Han's fellow members on the mercenary channel had the same content, I'm not going, then, bastards. Young Master Han cursed on the mercenary channel. No matter how much of an expert he was as a priest, he did not possess the necessary power to kill off his opponents, even if said opponent was alone. Upon closer inspection, he realized that only four messages of I'm not going, then had arrived on the mercenary channel. This meant that someone among the members had not said a word about this matter. Miles? Young Master Han gingerly probed. The matter at hand was precarious. Although young Master Han was the leader on paper, everyone was of equal standing in the mercenary group. Therefore, young Master Han could not oblige anyone to do his bidding. Since four had already declined to go and were nowhere to be seen, the priest young Master Han would have to face the opponent by himself if Gufei declined as well. Thankfully, Gufei was someone who would not pass up any chance to PvP and immediately sent a positive reply, I'll go. Young Master Han exhaled hugely in relief. With fear still lingering in his heart, he coldly said to the others, I'm gonna remember what you four did here. TSK. The four scoffed at his empty threat. Gufei had no way of squeezing through the crowd, 
so he could only follow the motion of the people and move closer bit by bit to the teleportation portal. Half an hour had passed by the time he finally got to the teleportation array and entered the respective map. A blue sky, white clouds, an unending field, and young Master Han were what greeted Gu Fei when he entered the map. Let's begin. Young Master Han said impatiently. Originally, the match would automatically begin at the appointed time for the mercenary PvP tournament. Due to the removal of the time restriction for players to enter their respective PvP arenas, the official time for the PvP tournament to start was cancelled as a corollary. Each match it would now begin once the system received the application of both parties stating that they were done with their preparations. Once Gu Fei nodded his head, Young Master Han promptly handed in their group's application and the system immediately began a five-second countdown. When the timer reached zero, white lights flashed and the two were sent to their real PvP arena. Compared to the plain and simple field from before, the map they were in now was much more lush and abundant. Since only three people were participating in this battle, they were assigned the smallest PvP arena in the tournament. The terrain had highs and lows, water and trees and birds flying among the many clouds in the sky. High hills were designated as the boundary for this map, reaching steepness of 90 degrees. Over there, young Master Han pointed somewhere in front of him as he observed the map. As this map was very small, the two could clearly see the four sides of a boundary surrounding them and their opponents standing no more than 200 meters away from them. Originally, this sort of single-member mercenary groups had the strongest participation was more important than the result mentality, as they essentially stood no chance of victory unless they met other single-member mercenary groups, but when the opponent saw that he was up against two players in this match, he felt that he still stood a fighting chance. Rushing forward with confident steps, the opponent arrived at a land depression and quickly disappeared from the two's line of sight. Let's go. Gu Fei pulled out his sword, MHM. Young Master Han agreed, following behind him. The two immediately caught sight of the player hiding in the depression. Gu Fei and Young Master Han were dressed in their respective job classes, allowing the opponent to tell at a glance that one was a mage and the other was a priest. The opposing player was a warrior. After identifying the two's job classes, the hopeful thought he had in his mind intensified. If the warrior had been up against melee job classes with a priest in tow, he might have discarded his hopes of winning the match. Since it was a mage and a priest, he only needed to engage them in melee. With the mage's inherently low HP, the priest beside him would surely not be able to sustain his life for long. Gu Fei proceeded forward ever so slowly as he was matching young Master Han's walking pace. Halfway there, young Master Han suddenly said, Go ahead and finish him off, I'll head up that hill and take a look around. What's there to see? Gu Fei asked, not understanding why the other would do something as troublesome as going up a hill. I'm going up to check the topological terrain of this map. The official website did not release any information about the 12 PvP arenas. Although this is the smallest map, I think it still has features similar to the other PvP tournament maps. By climbing up that higher landmass. I can get a better read of this whole place," young Master Han explained as he once again pointed to the spot he had previously indicated. Go on, then. Gu Fei said, completely not understanding what young Master Han was on about. The warrior, who was still hiding in the pit, was overcome with elation when he discovered that the two opposing players had split up. He wholly thought that the two could not find him. So the priest headed to a higher ground to search for him up there. One going to look on a higher ground and the other one continuing to search on the leveled ground. The warrior thought that this was a fatal mistake and quietly ridiculed the two noobs as he retracted his neck from his hiding place. He had already ascertained which higher ground young Master Han was heading. Deciding to eliminate the priest first, the warrior retreated from his current position and used a different route to head to the priest's intended destination. To prevent himself from getting discovered, the warrior crouched so low that he was practically crawling on the ground as he made his way toward the location. Everything was going very smoothly. Taking a different route, the warrior arrived somewhere on the other side of the higher ground. He stretched his head to take a look and spotted young Master Han sitting at a vantage point and looking left and right from time to time. Don't turn around. Don't turn around. Definitely do not turn around. The warrior repeated this mantra in his head as he carefully made his way up the hill. It was a pity that he was a warrior and not a thief, so he could not help but make loud, 
clanking noises with his heavy armor no matter how careful he proceeded forward. It was quiet all around him, so the armor's clanking sound was even more piercing to the ears. The warrior felt it was impossible for him to quietly make his way into melee range at this rate. Suddenly, it dawned on him that he was only dealing with a priest, a non-combat job class. Therefore, why would he need the defensive properties of his equipment? Thinking of this, he immediately took off his armor, pulled out his claim war, and made his way toward young Master Han. Without the armor, the warrior could now proceed forward with ease. His heart could not help but sing with elation at the prospect of winning this match. 30 meters, 20 meters, 10 meters. The warrior got closer to young Master Han with every step he took. This is great. After dealing with this fella, I'll find another pit to hide in to deal with it mage next. The warrior was beside himself with happiness when he was just 5 meters away from the priest, as if victory was well within his grasp. 3 meters. I can begin my attack at this distance. The warrior licked his lips as he raised his claymore with both hands toward young Master Han. Just as he was about to activate the charge skill, someone from behind him suddenly tapped his shoulder. The warrior was instantly petrified as he turned around half a beat later. A mage in black robe stood there. The warrior opened his mouth without making a sound, as he was still trying to maintain his silence to initiate his ambush. Realizing that his ambush would no longer succeed, the warrior finally found his voice. You, how did you? I'm your opponent, Gu Fei said plainly. Is, is, this a trap? The warrior asked rigidly. Of course not, Gu Fei said. He then asked young Master Han aloud, Are you done with your map research? Almost, young Master Han replied. He's about to finish, quickly put on your armor. Gu Fei said to the warrior, What? The warrior was absolutely flabbergasted at this point. Our fight will be better if you're wearing your armor. Look at you now, what sort of defense do you even have? Gu Fei patiently explained. At this moment, Young Master Han stood up and turned around with wrinkled brows, stop nagging already and just finish this quickly. You're the one who wanted me to slow down, now, you want me to move things faster, why is it so difficult to please you? Gu Fei muttered to himself. What do you two mean? The warrior asked, still rooted to the spot in his shock. Oh, he wanted to take a look at the map. So he asked me to take it easy beating you. That's why I followed you all the way without doing anything. Sorry about that. Gu Fei explained. You've been behind me all this time? The warrior asked, shocked. Gu Fei nodded his head, all this time. The warrior looked at Gu Fei and then at young Master Han. One had a look of expectation, while the other was simply impatient. What is this? The warrior asked as his hands dropped to his sides losing his will to fight. Twin incineration. Incinerate. Gu Fei suddenly struck, the flame warp glowed for a moment, insta killing the warrior. Why must you use Cyclone? Mistaking the warrior's movement as preparation to use Cyclone, Gu Fei dejectedly casted the twin incineration spell. He continued berating the warrior who had already disappeared, weren't you forcing me to insta kill you by using Cyclone? Wouldn't it be nice if we could fight slowly? In the next instant, the two were enveloped by white lights and were sent outside the PvP arena. Round 1 Winner, Young Masters Elite Mercenary Group Chapter 142, Lack of Formidable Guildmates How are the rewards? Young Master Han asked Gu Fei once they were teleported out of the PvP arena. They are all right, Gu Fei gave the EXP and gold coins that they had just earned a quick glance. Since this was the first match, the rewards were just average. After all, the awards as well as the odds of getting special rewards, would only become better the further they got into the PvP tournament. These rare, special awards were of course the most desirable rewards that the ambitious tournament participants all sought after. Since Gu Fei got stuck at the end of the line previously, he entered the map a bit too late. He also tracked the opposing warrior for quite some time. Therefore, a majority of the first batch of matches of the mercenary PvP tournament had long ended by the time the two got out of the map. Besides the steady stream of players being teleported back from their respective PvP arenas, few people were in the square. Royal God Call and War Without Wounds, who were cheekily leaning by a wall near the teleportation array, began to clap loudly when they saw Gu Fei and young Master Han step out of the teleportation portal. Not bad. You two got off with a flying start. 
Young Master Han's face was dark as he asked, Where is Sword Demon and Brother Assist? Sword Demon went to grind while Brother Assist went offline to check the forums, Royal God Call replied. The Guild vs Guild tournament was the next portion of the event, and Sword Demon and Brother Assist were not participating in that. How much EXP did you guys receive? Royal God Call asked as he came next to Gufei. Gufei reported the numbers and Royal God Call happily said, he he. Seems like I received free lunch, after all. But we got less EXP compared to you two who have directly participated in the match. As long as they were online, rewards from either the Mercenary PvP tournament or Guild vs Skill tournament would be given to all members of the winning teams even if they did not participate in the matches. Some of the players who had no particular interest in joining Mercenary groups tried their best to become part of large Mercenary groups to partake in these free rewards. Unfortunately for them, the Mercenary groups with actual strength had long reached their maximum member limit and there was no room in them for players who only wanted free meals during this PvP tournament. The four chatted gamely as they headed toward the main hall of guilds. The teleportation array for the guild vs guild tournament was located at the plaza outside the main hall of guilds. Considering that there were more participants for this portion of the event compared to the Mercenary PvP tournament. The time limit for entering the PvP arenas had of course been cancelled as well. The four men naturally got separated from one another once more, as they were now up against a crowd far more denser than the throng of people outside the Hall of Mercenaries. With everyone jostling and pushing about, Gufei once more found himself at the very back of the sea of players. He could feel his heart raging inside and nearly casted Blazing Tree of a Thousand Inferna to carve a path out. In fact, the mages beside him had a similar idea. The burgeoning resentment seemed to have coagulated upon the heads of all the present mages as dark clouds ominously blanketed their very thoughts. The originally appointed time for the start of the guild vs guild tournament was at 9 pm, but the game officials had to make an adjustment once more due to the large bulk of players. The teleportation array was opened without a restriction allowing the match to start once both parties finished their preparations and ending it immediately once the match ended. The mass of players kept moving, yet almost an hour passed before Gufei managed to enter the teleportation array. Cerulean sky, white clouds, vast field. The scenery the players first found themselves in seemed to be the designated map for the guild's preparation phase. In sporting terms, this place the players were first transported in to prepare for their matches was akin to the changing room or a locker room found in basketball or other sporting arenas. Gufei swept his gaze over this map for preparation and his thoughts went astray for a bit when he saw the pack of ladies nearby. 47. July announced when she spotted Gufei as well, saying, We're missing three more members. Although the event was something everyone looked forward to, there were always some players who would have all sorts of reasons to not make it. Out of the Amethyst Rebirth's 54 members, 4 did not come online tonight. What's the situation with our opposing guild? Gufei asked. Unbeatable under the heavens. A level 1 guild with 50 members all filled up, July replied. July considered level 1 and level 2 guilds as key opponents of the level 2 Amethyst Rebirth guild with its 54 members. This was one of the guilds she had talked about lengthily before. Since Gufei was daydreaming at the time, he registered none of the information about the said guild. Everyone, how do you think we should fight that guild? July asked. July, who was a guild leader, was being very impartial and inclusive at the moment even asking for everyone's opinion. Gufei had the impression of her being more like a spokesperson of Amethyst Rebirth rather than its guild leader. Although this was just a game and a guild leader should not be so serious about his or her position, it was still necessary for one to have the disposition of a leader. An example was the guild battle right now, a guild leader must command his or her members with confidence. Even if the command was poor, it would still be better than a scattered and directionless battle strategy. It was therefore somewhat inappropriate of July to gather everyone's input in an important time like this. This sort of leader would definitely have great difficulty in achieving anything in a different guild other than Amethyst Rebirth. Although such a guild leader was well received in Amethyst Rebirth, that might just be because of the agreeable personality of the ladies. It was at this moment that Luo Luo opined. Why don't we split into small teams? Let us split our members into two small teams like how we do it during level grinding, 
since we will be more familiar with coordinating with one another. This was not a particularly exciting idea. Just look at Luo Luo's grinding party that was mostly made up of mages, if these mages were to engage the opposing guild, would they not just be painting themselves as a large target? Although Gufei considered Luo Luo to have the better qualities of a guild leader, it was only because he preferred her personality and way of doing things over July's. Nonetheless, she was still just an average player when it came to formulating battle strategies. With that, all turned their gazes towards Felt Dancer who was currently meticulously polishing her dagger. As one of the five unyielding experts, what sort of brilliant idea would she come up with? Zia, ooh, do you have any opinions? July asked her directly. Opinion? Um, just kill opponents straight away. Everything will be over once they die, Svelte Dancer said matter-of-factly, not even pausing what she was doing. Ha ha ha. Gufei laughed to himself. It seemed like the five unyielding experts could only be proud of their high level. This woman was stronger than most people, yet she knew nothing about battle strategies and the ilk. She's just a gutsy warrior without any knowledge of strategies. Gufei thought disparagingly. Miles, how about you? July suddenly turned to ask Gufei. Ah! Gufei froze up. Now that it was his turn to be asked, he tried hard to come up with a brilliant battle strategy, yet he could only blushingly say in the end, just kill them outright. Gufei was crying inside his mind, turns out I am no better than Svelte Dancer, we are only good at one thing. In the end, we are just like Leroy Jenkins. However, Gufei should not be blamed for this, as it did not mean that an intelligent person would surely be able to devise a great battle strategy. Knowledge and understanding of the various job classes fortes, methods of combat, and fighting styles were needed for a player to come up with a brilliant battle strategy. For example, Gufei qualified to be called a top-notch solo player that could brave dangers in a rebounds per game. When it came to commanding, however, it would require an expert well versed in all sorts of strategy games. The ladies were weak at commanding precisely because they usually had no interest in such strategy games. Gufei reckoned that out of all the ladies that he knew in this game, only vast lushness appeared to at least have a bit of knowledge about battle strategies. At the very least, her orders had been pretty good during that battle on the street when Gufei was taking revenge for Willow. As for the Amethyst Rebirths 50 members here, not one seemed to possess talent in this strategizing part of the game. In the end, the proposed battle plan was, rush together toward the enemies and overwhelm them through sheer number. Such a crude and simple battle tactic. It was as good as not saying anything at all, yet this group of ladies sincerely nodded their heads as if they had received some sort of excellent strategy. If Amethyst Rebirth wished to go far in this event, it seemed that they would have to rely upon the might and heroism of an indomitable player or players. Hero number one's felt dancer finished polishing her dagger and, after lovingly caressing it for a bit, hung it by her waist as she looked at Gufei. Let's see who has the higher kill count. Hero number two Gufei smiled as he pulled out his sword, Moonlit Night Falls. Preparation complete. July submitted her application at this point. The opposing team had already been waiting for them for a long time. The scenery around them changed as everyone was teleported from the changing room into the real PvP arena. Unbeatable Under the Heavens had 50 members but 5 of them did not show up for this match. These two guilds combined had 95 players, so the PvP arena Gufei found himself in now was much larger than the one he and young Master Han had been placed in for the mercenary PvP match. At the very least, he could not see the enemies at a glance from their location. Advance forward. July ordered. The ladies swayed their hips in a carefree way as they ran across the field, laughing, joking, frolicking, and chasing after one another. Faster. No. You slow down. The ladies laughed and shouted uncaringly as they advanced forward, not caring if some players ran fast or slowly. This resulted into them drifting apart the further they went forward. Svelte Dancer, with her amazing running speed, activated Fleet Foot all the way through and immediately disappeared into the horizon. Gufei kindly matched his pace to the priests, thinking he needed to protect them with their inherently slow movement speed. In the end, he just became a target for Luo Luo's constant bestowal of heal. This is a PvP match. Be serious and stop wasting your mana. Gufei admonished. Ha ha. I'm just joking, why so serious? 
Luo Luo dot asked as she ate a banana to replenish her mana. Fuck, their participation is more important than the result mentality is at the extreme. Gu Fei saw how the ladies were acting so carefree as if they were on a tour and not a PvP match. While they did not approach this matter with winning in mind and more of enjoying themselves to the fullest, Gu Fei was different. He was hoping that Amethyst Rebirth could fight a few more rounds so that he could have more chances of slaying people. At this rate, won't we just get eliminated in this round? Guess I must depend on myself. With that thought in his mind, Gu Fei no longer stayed around with this lot of plotting priests as he broke off into a sprint, leaving the lot of ladies behind in the blink of an eye. After running for a while, Gu Fei saw felt dance prone by a small mound ahead speaking over as if she was checking something out. Gu Fei hurried over and lay sprawled on the ground beside her. He peeked out his head and asked, What are you looking at? You're so slow. Svelte dancer mocked Gu Fei. Of course, you're a thief. Gu Fei answered. You're a mage? A. Ha ha. You're shit one. Svelte dancer laughed at the bad joke she had stumbled upon unintentionally. Gu Fei did not bother answering her as he had already taken the situation in from beneath the mound. Before them, the unbeatable under the heavens guild was slowly moving its troops around, the form teams were maintaining a formation, with the warriors at the vanguard, the mages and archers at the center, and the thieves and priests at the rear. Knights were split into the two wings of this formation as they constantly refreshed the stat buffs that they had placed on their fellow members. The rare and few fighters in the guild were casually filling in the gaps of the formation. Look at how professional they are compared to those ladies. Gu Fei frustratedly thought to himself. If the opposing guild's formation were to clash with the Amethyst Rebirth's scattered formation, the outcome would be less than suspenseful. How long are you gonna lie here and watch? Let's start the killing. Gu Fei said as he jumped up the mound and pointed his moonlit knife falls forward, shouting, Blazing Tree, are you mad? Svelte Dancer dove after Gu Fei, swiftly tackling him down to the ground. The sound of several arrows piercing through air was heard as they went past the mound. That enemy guild has long prepared an ambush and is just waiting for our guild to show up. Svelte Dancer exclaimed. Is that so? You better get off me quickly, then, Gu Fei said to Svelte Dancer who lay sprawled over him. Svelte Dancer was incensed, I have yet to mention how you force me to get so physically close to you. Look above you, Gu Fei did not know if he should laugh or cry at what she had just said. Why are people's thoughts always so filthy? Svelte Dancer extended her neck upward and saw above them that the air seemed to rumble out of nowhere and tear apart instantly as countless flaming dragons erupted out of thin air before they turned into burning circles similar to wheels. Descending Wheel of Flames Chapter Notes 1. The joke here is a Chinese homophone. One of the characters for Mage, sounds similar to the character for Boop. Chapter 143, The Incantation That Turns the Tide Aw. Svelte Dancer screamed as she hurriedly rolled away from Gu Fei to the side. Gu Fei dexterously used his one hand, which was planted to the ground, to tumble toward the side as well. The flaming wheel slightly brushed against Gu Fei's body on its way to the mound that they were originally on, looking like an upturned egg tart caught on fire. Run quickly. Svelte Dancer called out to Gu Fei. Gu Fei nodded his head. He had just realized that the fight today was different from his fights in the past. The bounty mission he had previously accomplished was technically done through ambushing his targets. Even if he warned the targets prior to his attacks, the targets would still be caught by surprise and would never be able to deal with him in such a grand and proper manner like their opposing guild today. With over 40 players in the unbeatable under the heavens formation, the level of concentration that these players were showing right now was vastly different from the level of concentration of Gu Fei's bounty mission targets who were usually grinding on monsters or drinking inside the taverns. These current opponents treated anything foreign in their line of sight as a target to be eliminated. Would the usual level grinders have this level of alertness? Svelte Dancer and Gu Fei ran as fast as they could for a few meters before looking backward and seeing that the opponents had already rushed toward the mound. Let's try to break up their formation by luring the faster ones over to us. Gu Fei said to Svelte Dancer. The lady nodded her head as the two began to slow down. Had they continued to run at their full speed, the enemies chasing them would have simply been left in the dust. Would the enemies still give chase to these two given how fast they were at full speed? And yet, 
no one seemed to be rushing toward them even though they were now running at a slower pace. The opponents unexpectedly remained calm and continued to maintain their formation. Ascending the small mound and making their way toward the two with a steady pace, they evidently did not intend to mess up their formation. They're not fooled. Gu Fei sighed. That was the difference between having a good battle commander and not having any at all. Would real armies and soldiers emphasize so much on following orders and commands if those actions were meaningless? The two were not sure if they should continue to run or not now that their plan of breaking up the enemy's formation had failed. The enemies continued to steadily edge closer to them as they stared blankly at the tidy formation. Use your spells to cover me. I'm going in. Svelte Dancer said to Gu Fei as she took out her dagger. You sure you could pull it off? Gu Fei asked this question sincerely, yet it instead ended up inciting Svelte Dancer's fighting spirit. Just you watch. Svelte Dancer hollered as she activated Fleet Foot and bounded toward the enemies. Ah, slow down. Gu Fei chased after her. His speed was regrettably nowhere near Svelte Dancer's, so he was very quickly left behind by her. How the heck was he going to cover her at this rate? It turned out that Svelte Dancer's speed had also shocked their enemies, as the archers with bows drawn and mages with raised staves that were planning to launch long-range attacks remained rooted to the spot when the lone figure hurtled straight toward them on fleet foot at an unbelievable speed. Truly. The proverb an onlooker could see more than the involved party held some truth. In this current situation, the ones not directly in charge of things managed to see everything clearly. Hurry up and attack. What are you all staring blankly for? Shouted such an onlooker, snapping the archers and mages out of their shock to initiate their attacks. But there were only few archers in the opposing guild's formation that was made up of 45 men with its balanced assortment of the seven job classes so they could not train arrows on the target. Svelte Dancer nimbly whirled her dagger defensively, not allowing even one arrow to strike her. In the next moment, the mages unleashed their spells. Since none of the archer's arrows scored a hit on the target, the mages decided to cast AO spells, such as Descending Wheel of Flames and Blazing Tree of a Thousand Inferno instead of fireball that had a slow tracking speed. The flames of the casted spells acted as a cordon between Svelte Dancer and the troops. She almost got bombarded to death by the enemies when she charged toward them, but she was able to stop herself in time just before she stepped into the AO of the enemy's spell. At the next moment, she saw a few flashes of white light from the enemy's line. It seemed that homing projectile had been employed by the archers on their arrows. Homing projectile's speed as well as its damage output, was not comparable to Snipe, yet its tracking effect was deadly. Svelte Dancer turned around to run. When compared to the other players, her movement speed was impossibly fast, but the arrows on homing projectile currently after her were still faster. Moreover, Fleet Foot was on its cool down period right now, so she could only run at her normal speed, resulting in those projectiles to home close to her bum. At this same moment, Gu Fei finally managed to catch up to Svelte Dancer who had left him behind. He burst into a bout of raucous laughter when he saw her rush toward the opposing guild's formation only to hurriedly sprint backward. Cover. Where is my cover fire? Svelte Dancer criticized Gu Fei as she ran, even turning around to check how far the arrows on homing projectile were on her. One way of dodging these arrows was to maintain her distance from them until the skill lost its effect. Gu Fei stepped forward and raised his moonlit nightfalls, swiftly cutting down an arrow on homing projectile. Analysis determined that an archer's attack was the easiest in game skill to disrupt. Theoretically speaking, the attacks of archers were the easiest to disrupt because they had fast speed to compensate for this. Svelte Dancer glanced backward to note the direction of the arrows on homing projectile tailing her, only to receive a shock at the sight of Gu Fei easily disrupting the projectiles until only one was left. If Svelte Dancer were the one currently deflecting the arrows on homing projectile instead of Gu Fei, she would only be confident enough to deal with one or two of them. Otherwise, she would not be running like this right now. With only the final arrow left, Svelte Dancer stopped in her tracks and turned around to strike it down. Svelte Dancer assumed that Gu Fei could easily deflect the arrows because they were not targeting him. She believed this to be the only logical explanation for such a feat. Meanwhile, their current predicament seemed to have no solution, seeing as the two of them were up against 45 opposing players. Help me block the arrows. Suddenly, 
Gu Fei shouted this at her as she was pondering on the best course of action for them. Ah? Uh? Svelte Dancer asked, stunned. Looking at Gu Fei, she saw him steadily pointing his moonlit nightfalls onto the enemy's ranks unmindful of the several arrows heading his way. Svelte Dancer do not have time to ruminate more about this and just quickly darted to Gu Fei's side to defend him from the arrows. In an instant, she snapped four arrows with a wave of her dagger. Although two arrows embedded themselves into her body, Svelte Dancer managed to survive them due to her op equipment. Blazing Tree of a Thousand Inferno Arise! Blocking that wave of arrows was sufficient for Gufei to finish his incantation. Various spells had different rules for casting. For instance, the two AO spells, Blazing Tree of a Thousand Inferno and Ascending Wheel of Flames, required mages to remain stationary while casting them. Otherwise, the spells would get disrupted immediately. Furthermore, spells were not bounded by a time limit, and the incantations would only be considered as complete once mages finished chanting them. Pronouncing the words clearly was a must as well. If the incantation was said in a rush, the system would not detect it. This was as good as not chanting an incantation to begin with. If J2 were a mage in parallel world, he would most likely be the worst mage there was. Gu Fei's speech was intelligible, his words were well pronounced and his chanting speed was suitable. Since the attacks in him were successfully blocked by Svelte Dancer, there was no reason for his incantation to fail. However, it was just one mage spell so the opposing side did not consider it a threat as they steadily advanced toward Gu Fei and Svelte Dancer while the enemy archers, mages, and other long-range job classes continued to unleash attacks upon the two. Evade. What are you standing there in a daze for? Gu Fei, who was about to make a dash for it, saw Svelte Dancer still standing there foolishly. Svelte Dancer hurried to Gu Fei's side as she asked blankly, Where's your spell? Gu Fei smiled faintly as he snapped his fingers. Flames blossomed and exploded as the raging inferno erupted. The team of 45 men looked as if it had stepped onto a huge landmine and was very quickly enveloped by the sea of flames. Sigh. They didn't evade it. Svelte Dancer exclaimed in dismay. Gu Fei was momentarily mystified, asking whose side are you on? What is so bad about them not evading? But... Svelte Dancer was about to say that the opposing guild's formation would be in a mess if they had evaded his spell, yet no words came out of her mouth in the end. All that was left of Gu Fei's blazing tree of a thousand inferno on the field was some glowing embers, burning a big hole through the unbeatable under the heavens formation. The leftover enemies were shocked and perplexed, their eyes filling with horror. The priests at the rear of the now disrupted formation were even more at a loss over what had just happened. They were originally planning to bestow heal on their guildmates, yet those guildmates ended up being insta-killed by the searing inferno. Go on. Gu Fei waves felt dancer onward, having already charged toward them himself. He merely casted blazing tree of a thousand inferno on a whim. Gu Fei's first love when it came to PvPing was still melee or directly confronting the enemies with his sword, after all. Hey, you! Svelte Dancer had clearly never seen a mage that headed straight into the thick of the fray like this before. Sadly, she only managed to utter these two words before she was left in the dust by Gu Fei who had already rushed toward the enemies himself. Svelte Dancer could only chase after him. The unbeatable under the heavens players had yet to recover from their shock, but the two full agility build demons were already upon their ranks in the next moment. Twin Incineration Incinerate Gu Fei casted another spell that could insta-kill the others right from the start. Although his blazing tree of a thousand inferno managed to insta-kill half of the troops here, the ensuing two versus over twenty players still exerted quite the pressure on Gu Fei, or at least, the Fi was not yet at the point where he could toy on his opponents. The slash under twin incineration he had unleashed went through three players and killed two right away. The last person was a priest and he only got burned by the spell and did not suffer Moonlit Nightfall's physical damage, allowing him to barely cling on to his life. Svelte Dancer finally arrived at where they were and immediately unleashed an equally oppressive attack as Gu Face. She brandished her dagger into a fast blur and quickly disposed of two opponents. Gu Fei sent another slash on twin incineration and slew two more enemies. It was only now that the enemies finally reacted, abandoning all thoughts of maintaining their formation, 
the remaining players charged toward the two and encircled them haphazardly. Goofy's twin incineration took down another player and stepped backward until his back was almost leaning against Svelte dancers. Hey, you okay over there? If you can do it, why can't I? Svelte dancer retorted. All right, then. Hold on for a while. I'm gonna eat a banana first. Goofy's twin incineration cleaved a path out for him in exchange for the two players' lives. Charging out of the crowd, Goofy fished out a banana from his dimensional pocket to eat it. Unlike Svelte Dancer's dagger attacks, his attack required a high mana consumption. Saying that the mage Goofy's mana pool was currently depleted was already being kind. In all honesty, it was completely empty right now. Damn you, you scoundrel. Svelte Dancer wanted to cry but no tears would come out. How would she know that Goofy had asked that question to leave her to the lions and run off on his own? One person against an encirclement of over ten men, even Svelte Dancer's heart wavered as she shrieked, When will you be back? Goofy was peeling his banana as he ran, answering her with, As soon as I can. Hold on. In the end, the unbeatable under the heavens men learned that Goofy was out of mana. Not letting go of this chance, Many hastily chased after Goofy and eased the pressure off Svelte Dancer considerably. Goofy faced backward. When he saw the situation behind him, he immediately realized that the opposing men had split themselves into two groups. Svelte Dancer no longer had to push herself that far as he quickly gobbled up the banana. Although his mana had yet to replenish to a point that he was contented fault with. He could still handle these few enemies tailing him without being excessive. He put Moonlit Nightfalls back into his dimensional pocket and took out his Sacred Flames of Baptism instead. Now, he no longer had to be so cautious with his opponents like before. Chapter 144, End of the First Round of Battle 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Goofy did a head count of the players chasing after him. There were six players behind him. Yet 11 players stayed with Svelte Dancer. This made Goofy feel displeased. Do these people deem me as below par compared to her? This thinking should not be blamed on their opponents, though. Who would actually regard a mage with depleted mana as a threat? As such, the six men enthusiastically chased after Goofy without a shred of fear. Just as they were five meters away from Goofy, someone among the six fell onto the ground with a loud thud. The other five men stopped on their tracks in astonishment. When did someone initiate an attack on them? None of them even sensed it coming toward them. All of them looked at Goofy who had not moved even a bit from his spot with widened eyes. They then looked down on their comrade who had fallen to the ground on his back with his four limbs sprawled. The person seemed to have received quite the shock as he repeatedly shouted, Am I dead? Am I already dead? The five men were not amused and were mildly annoyed by his antics, especially when they spotted the banana peel on his soul. How can you be so careless? Goofy admonished. The five ignored the man on the ground and headed toward Goofy with a roar. Witnessing the might of Goofy's spell damage, they knew that now was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to take him down with his empty mana. Make haste. The five rushed toward Goofy. Two meters away from Goofy. A warrior among the five activated charge with a bellow. Goofy sidestepped and sent a slash to the nape of the warrior who had gone past him with sacred flames of baptism. The warrior, whose charge did not connect with anything, looked backward when he felt a breeze coming from behind him and saw in time Goofy's Chinese broadsword heading closer to his neck. This almost frightened him to death, especially since his charge had yet to end. Continuing to stomp the final two meters, the warrior thought to himself, it's over. By the time I stop charging forward, my head will have fallen off my body. Unexpectedly, the warrior's head was still intact when he finally halted his steps. Checking his HP, he saw that it had barely dropped. Now that he thought of it, what sort of damage could a mirror mage inflict? The warrior perked up when he finished thinking of that and promptly raised his claymore to launch an attack on Gufe once more. His four guildmates had also arrived at his location and joined his assault on Gufe by wielding the weapons in their hands. Behind them, the player who had become a victim of the discarded banana peel finally recovered from his shock and managed to get up and join the fight. However, Goofy did not view these melee opponents as a threat and merely sent cuts sailing through the air with his Chinese broadsword toward them. A cleave, thrust, slash, twist, 
cut. Every stroke and every move he made always hit his targets. The men grew astonished the more they fought with Gu Fei. The nimbleness that Gu Fei was displaying seemed unbelievable to their eyes. While none of their attacks or skills could hit Gu Fei no matter which angle they struck him. Gu Fei's counterattacks could not be dodged by them. Although the damage dealt by each strike was low, it was only a matter of time before their HP were reduced to zero. Furthermore, his Chinese broadsword's occasional fiery glow signaled the proxing of an additional fire attack that seared them quite painfully. They truly regretted not bringing a priest with them to chase after Gu Fei, as the mage with empty mana whom they had initially thought could be killed off easily turned out to be A.H.H. A scream echoed when one of them died from the Chinese broadsword's fiery glow. The five men were even more flustered now. Seeing the cuts and bruises that they had sustained from this fight, the possibility of them dying from simply being burnt by the mage without a priest's support was large. Priest, let's get us a priest. With this realization, the five immediately turned around and fled. They no longer tried to stop Gu Fei from recovering his mana, as it was more important for them to keep their lives. However, they received an even greater shock when they turned around. It turned out that their guildmates who had not chased after Gu Fei were in more dire straits than them. Svelte Dancer's fighting style of using Fleet Foot was more extraordinary than Gu Fei's. Her form flitting through the crowd and reaping the lives of the men very much resembled a combine harvester. The six men could at least activate their skills once or twice when facing Gu Fei. As for the players that that had remained behind, they could not even keep up with Svelte Dancer's speed and would even accidentally unleash their skills upon their guildmates oftentimes. At present, five out of the eleven players facing Svelte Dancer had been subdued by her. With Svelte Dancer in the front and Gu Fei at the rear, these five men were now at a loss on where they should go. Upon realizing that the two were unparalleled experts, they all lost their hopes of winning this match. In the current 11 vs 2 scenario, Gu Fei and Svelte Dancer actually won with an overwhelming advantage. The 11 men completely lost their will to fight and only made despondent attempts at resisting. Gu Fei and Svelte Dancer increased their PvP tempo and very quickly took down the remaining 10 players. When only a warrior was left, he tremblingly backed away with his claymore placed in front. Getting killed in the PvP tournament was not scary since it had no penalty whatsoever. Nonetheless, the warrior felt frightened by his opponent's overwhelming strength. The two's act of demolishing their guild of 45 men was precisely what left the warrior quaking in his boots. Just who are you two? The warrior asked, bewildered. Gu Fei and Svelte Dancer looked at each other, what should we say? I shan't bother you two anymore. I'll just do it myself. The warrior raised his claymore horizontally to take his life. Don't. Svelte Dancer hurriedly shouted. Gu Fei and the warrior perplexedly looked at Svelte Dancer, only to see her drifting behind the warrior and thrusting her dagger into him to take his life. You're a kill point. Svelte Dancer mumbled as she watched the warrior turn into a stream of white light. With the end of the PvP match, the system quickly displayed its result. Since Amethyst Rebirth had no casualties and unbeatable under the heavens lost all its members, Amethyst Rebirth received a perfect score in this PvP match. On the members' contribution screen, Gu Fei who had taken down 32 players was awarded 32 kill points, Svelte Dancer who had killed off 13 men was correspondingly awarded 13 kill points, and the rest of the ladies who had not done anything during the PvP match received 0 kill point. Because Gu Fei had the highest contribution, he was selected as this match's MVP and was awarded another 10 kill points. What is this kill point for? Gu Fei asked Svelte Dancer. He did not know if his previous mercenary PvP matches few participants resulted into the scoring being conducted fast, but he failed to notice this system prompt at the time. Svelte Dancer replied, I don't know as well. But since there's such a statistic, I believe that it is related to the PvP tournament's final rewards. As they were conversing with each other, the two got enveloped by white lights and were transported back to the plaza outside the main hall of guilds. The other 48 ladies were now beside Gu Fei and Svelte Dancer. Their faces all showed varying degrees of confusion. Did you two kill all of our 45 opponents? The ladies stared at the two from within the surrounding crowd. Although none of them saw the whole battle. The system's scoring shows that all 45 members of the opposing guild had fallen by Gu Fei's and Svelte Dancer's hands. How depressing! Svelte Dancer moaned, saying, 
he took all the kill points. She flashed Gu Fei a spiteful expression. Gu Fei shrugged his shoulders. Twenty of his kill points came from his blazing tree of a thousand inferno. Gu Fei had no choice but to unleash the spell upon seeing the large group that he and Svelte Dancer were up against. If he could, he would not use an AO spell at all. After all, he somewhat felt discomfited from gaining twenty kill points by casting a spell only once as it was equivalent to losing his chance to PvP against 20 opponents with that one stroke. Thinking of that, Gu Fei felt even more dejected. Amid the laughter and cheers, someone suggested celebrating this victory. The only entertainment available in-game was visiting a tavern, but none of the taverns would have such poor business that it could take in 50 guests in one go. The Amethyst Rebirths ladies went to many establishments yet they failed to find one that could accommodate all 50 of them. All they got was a lot of attention along the way. Indeed, seeing so many ladies walking down the streets together was very eye-catching. It was made even more eye-catching by the fact that only one man was among these ladies. Realizing this fact, Gu Fei began to walk with lowered head to the point of appearing stoop as he did his best to hide within the crowd of women. When their group passed by a log-off point, he hurriedly shouted, A UFO! Such low-level trickery would obviously fool no one, yet the reticent Gu Fei's sudden exclamation startled the ladies. Without saying another word to the ladies, Gu Fei sprinted toward the safe zone and logged off. This was how the first day of the event ended. Overall, people did not notice any unexpected outcomes. The first-rate guilds and mercenary groups, such as Traversing Four Seas and the Black Hand, that many considered as the most likely to win the tournaments easily got past the first round. As for the inconspicuous mid-tier guilds and mercenary groups, not one cared about anything unusual happening to them. This was exactly what had happened between the low-tier guilds, such as Amethyst Rebirth and Unbeatable Under the Heavens. The words of Unbeatable Under the Heavens guild held little weight, so no one bothered taking note of their accounts. Since this guild with 45 members was eradicated by the opposing guild's two members, everyone thought of this guild as weak and unimportant. After all, only an idiot would boast about losing in a match. From the perspective of the Amethyst Rebirths ladies, they would naturally avoid promoting Gu Fei and Svelte Dancer's PvP feat since the two were mum about it. On the second day of the event, the officials announced the matchups for the second round. This made it convenient for the various guilds and mercenary groups to research about their opponents and to formulate battle tactics accordingly. However, everyone was extremely disappointed that the largest guild traversing four seas and the second largest guild Karaz would not meet in this second round. Everyone was looking forward to this matchup as it would be as good as defeating a strong opponent no matter who won or lost between the two guilds. Sadly, Fate did not work the way people wished it, and these large guilds ended up drawing some seemingly weak small guilds. Instead, quite a few players began to condemn the officials for fixing the drawing process and deliberately avoiding matching up the stronger guilds with one another. Such sort of talks was definitely far too extreme. With only so few top guilds and so many small guilds in Yunjuan City, the chances of a large guild meeting another large guild so early in the rounds were simply two minutes. If the small guilds chosen to go against these big guilds were thick-skinned enough, they might have reasons to suspect that the officials were trying to undermine them by forcing them to meet strong foes in the early stages in order to prevent their existence from bringing trouble to the game company. The real experts would never waste time finding excuses over this quandary and would instead face the problem head on. Level 4 Cloud Herder Mercenary Group with 73 members This mercenary group is ranked 6th in Yunjuan City. Its leader is Fo Herder amid the clouds. Number 7 on the Warrior Experience Leaderboard We struck the lottery, boys. Brother Assist enthusiastically said as he announced their enemy group for the second round in the PvP tournament to the other five members of Young Masters Elite Mercenary Group. Chapter 145, A Battle Not Fit for Someone Without a Sense of Direction 73 Men. Everyone present echoed the number. Plus. The levels of these 73 players are not low. 27 of them are at level 40, 39 at level 39, and 7 at level 38. Since young master and I don't really have any fighting power individually, this means that you will have to face 18 players each, 
brother assist continued to say. Everyone was speechless, even Gouffe did not dare say that he could take on 18 players by himself. After his experience with yesterday's PvP, he now fully understood that this sort of goal-orientated tournament posed more problems for him than his casual PvP with unsuspecting bounty mission targets. In this PvP tournament, even simply showing half of his head would invite the bombardment of the archers' arrows and mages' spells. Evidently, Young Master's elite mercenary group with its six members would have no chance of winning if it faced this current opposing mercenary group head-on. We must formulate an effective battle strategy to win this match, Brother Assist said as he turned to face Young Master Han. Young Master Han nodded his head, this is why I said that winning a match depends entirely on me. Everyone was speechless once more, albeit for a different reason. Alright, let's go. Young Master Han majestically declared as he stood up, displaying the aura of being a leader. He theatrically said, A mere crowd herder mercenary group will not stall the pace of my progress. It's cloud herder. Brother Assist reminded him, That group is bound to fall by my hands, so its name is not worth remembering. Young Master Han showed the other five men how the Cloud Herder mercenary group was beneath his notice by leisurely walking out of the room. Young Master sure is amazing. Royal God Call sighed, saying, I'm always confident with my ability to deal with strong opponents, yet even my confidence miraculously disappears with him around. It's like you lose all sense of security, Gufei agreed. Brother Assist and Wara without wounds did not make a sound. As for Sword Demon. The closest battle buddy of young Master Han, he merely smiled faintly as he stood up and left the room next. The remaining four men stood up at the same time and exited the tavern one after another. With the second round participants of the mercenary PvP tournament being substantially less than the first round participants and the teleportation array being opened three hours earlier, all the matches for the second round were able to start at exactly 7 p.m. It was unlike yesterday's situation where a match would only begin once both parties' preparations were done. Presently, the system automatically regarded players who did not make it to the changing room at 7 p.m. as non-participants. Because of this rule, quite a number of players entered the teleportation array earlier allowing many to conclude their preparations and strategy meetings inside the changing room for their respective PvP matches ahead of time. Hardly any players were left by the time Young Master's elite mercenary group arrived in the square outside the Hall of Mercenaries, so its members were able to teleport themselves right away into the changing room. There's still half an hour left, Young Master Han said as he looked at the time. He then promptly sat down on the ground and reached into his dimensional pocket for a bottle of liquor. Anyone? Young Master Han offered the bottle to the other five members. Go get drunk by yourself. Everyone collectively replied. No need to be courteous. I still have some on me. Young Master Han brought out another bottle and showed it to them. The five adamantly shook their heads and no longer bothered with Young Master Han who had opened a bottle for the others before proceeding to drink one by himself. Brother Assist would call out the number of players of the opposing group whenever it got updated. 55 men. Another one, so it's 56. And it's now 57. This went on and on until Cloud Herder Mercenary Group's counter remained unchanged for 5 minutes at 68 men with just 3 minutes remaining before the start time of the PvP match at 7 p.m. There are 68 of them. Looks like that is all from Cloud Herder, Brother Assist finally concluded. That is still quite a lot. Young Master Han stood up and carefully poured the remaining content of the bottle of liquor to the ground before tossing it over, prepare to move out. Leave your mercenary channel open. In flashes of white light, the six men were teleported straight into the PvP arena. Young Master Han swept his gaze over the map's terrain first before instructing his fellow mercenaries, Sword Demon, Miles, Assist, and Wounds, head toward the four sides of this map's boundary. Get to each corner and report your coordinates to me. Brother Assist and Wounds, head to the ones near, Miles and Sword Demon, go to the ones far. The four headed to the indicated locations without a complaint. Questioning the orders of the commander on the battlefield was a big no-no, unless one thought of himself or herself as a power extreme centurion one that could reverse the course of events with his or her hands. Although this was but a game, one person's recklessness could still negatively affect the outcome of a PvP. Royal, you might be our most unstable factor in this PvP match, young Master Han honestly told Royal God Call. Why? 
Royal God Call asked, surprised. If I tell you a set of coordinates, can you find its corresponding location? Young Master Han asked. Royal God Call blushed redder than a baboon's ass. His poor sense of direction was as outstanding as his prestige as the number one mage in various MMOs. Stay with me for now. Young Master Han brought Royal God Call with him to the middle of a forest by a small hill. At this same moment, Sword Demon and the rest reported their coordinates on the mercenary channel accordingly. Coordinates, 500, 500, Gufei stated. Coordinates, 0, 500, Sword Demon reported next. Coordinates, 0, 0 was set by war without wounds. Coordinates, 500, 0, Brother Assist shared lastly. Oh, this map has almost the same measurements as that map I've measured before. Young Master Han said, adding, nobody has gotten discovered, right? Wait a while and I'll be able to monitor your locations shortly. Young Master Han and Royal God Call had reached the peak of the small hill by the time he finished talking. Young Master Han lifted his head and looked about as he muttered, This hill is not as high as that hill over there, but the treetops over there should be about the same height. He then walked about before finally stopping beside a tall tree. Looking up, he observed it left and right and said to Royal God Call while patting the tree, Come, give me a lift, huh? Royal God Call asked not understanding what young Master Han wanted him to do. Young Master Han pointed up the tree, up there. You want to climb up the tree? Royal God Call bewilderedly gave young Master Han a boost to climb the tree. With his effeminate face, the alcoholic young Master Han was still adept at doing things. Through Royal God Call's assistance, young Master Han adroitly clambered up the branches of the tree. What are you trying to do? Royal God Call shouted from the base of the tree. Don't shout. Remember to communicate through the mercenary channel if we are far from each other. Young Master Han managed to send a message as he climbed further up the tree. What are you two doing? Upon seeing his message to Royal God Call, the other four inquired on the mercenary channel. Oh, the viewing range from up here isn't too bad. Young Master Han exclaimed on the mercenary channel. What? The five were left clueless with that response of his. Wounds, the enemy is heading to your location, 500, 0, miles, you're currently positioned far behind the enemy. Can you see them? Nope, Gufei replied. Head toward 428, 427. There is a mound in that location, do you see it? Young Master Han asked. Yes. But how do you know its coordinates? Gufei asked as he headed toward the indicated location. Talent. Young Master Han answered simply, chuckling, Sore Demon, there's a low ground over by 29, 476, go there and refresh your coordinates when you can. Got it, Sword Demon acknowledged and moved toward the indicated location as well. The players from Crowd Herder have gotten near our spawn point. Wounds, your coordinates, Young Master Han informed after a while, 59, 2. Also, it's Cloud Herder. War without wounds corrected. Do you see that wooden house over by 35, 64 yet? Young Master Han asked. I see it. I'll head over there now. I'm not asking you to head there. The enemies are near that location. Is there anything around you that you can use to hide yourself? Keep yourself hidden first. I don't really have a clear view of your location since some goddamn trees are blocking my line of sight. Young Master Han cursed. MHM. There's a large boulder here. Hide behind that and report your coordinates. 54, 16, War Without Wounds said after hiding behind the boulder. Young Master Han adjusted his position upon the tree until he could find an angle where he could see the large boulder. Oh, it looks like you can't hide there for long. Get ready to use Cyclone. Cut down as many opponents as you can. The Cloud Herder Mercenary Group's members just reached Young Master's Elite Mercenary Group's spawn point and did not discover a trace of the six men, so they began to split themselves into smaller teams to comb the area. Eight men are headed your direction, wounds. Looks like you'll be the first to sacrifice yourself for the team. We will remember you, Young Master Han stated apathetically. Fucker, you guys better not lose. War Without Wounds tightened his grip on his claymore. Naturally, get ready, young Master Han warned. War Without Wounds claymore was angled off the ground. It was in a position to unleash Cyclone and brutally ran through his enemies once they showed their heads to him. Fuck, you've already been discovered. Hurry and rush out, 
young Master Han quickly shouted. War without wounds also noticed the fiery glow that that had appeared above him. The enemies evidently discovered that someone was hiding behind the boulder so, instead of coming over, they simply had their mages directly bombard the area with spells. War without wounds bellowed as he rushed out. Although he managed to evade the descending wheel of flames coming from above, the sight that had greeted him upon his emergence from behind the boulder left him completely discouraged. The enemies had already taken precautions against an ambush coming from behind the boulder and maintained a fair distance from it. When War Without Wounds rushed out, he immediately received the concerted attacks of all 68 men from the Cloud Herder mercenary group. Arrows, spells, long-range attacks rained upon him. No matter how high a warrior's defense and HP was, Surviving this barrage of attacks that held nothing back was simply impossible. War Without Wounds had neither Gu Fei's nor Svelte Dancer's fast reaction and movement speed. Although his claymore managed to cleave a few balls of fire heading his way, he could not disperse all of them, especially that soon to land descending wheel of flames. Under the infill light of arrows and flames, War Without Wounds transformed into a stream of white light. In the list of Young Masters Elite Mercenary Group's participating members, War Without Wounds name dimmed as the opposing mercenary group was awarded one kill point. Brother Assist, your location is a little conspicuous. Head over to a mound at 468, 101. The circumstances look dire, so young Master Han increased his commanding tempo. Miles, have you reached it? Stay where you are. The Cloud Herder mercenary group finished splitting up the 68 players into 8-man teams and headed around the map in 8 directions. As for the remaining 4 players, they headed toward the highest points of the map. The opponents are about to obtain the high ground. Sword Demon, quickly head toward 128, 412 using your fleet foot, there's a forest in that location. Brother Assist, there are 2 teams heading your way, so move toward 399. 412. Make haste, there's another team coming toward you from 178, 134. Get to that low ground before they arrive in order to get away undetected. Miles, there's a team of 8 heading toward your direction. Great. I'll take care of them. Goofy was raring to go. No, don't do that. Another team is nearby in the 12 o'clock direction. If you engage those 8 men, you'll end up taking all 16 of them. Young Master Han cautioned, adding, from behind that mound, head toward 426, 375. I shouldn't have to worry about you with your speed, yeah? Of course. Gufei actually wanted to try facing off against 16 men all at once. But since this was a group activity, he was first and foremost a member of a group. MMM, Royal. Royal God Call, who had been ignored all this while was finally addressed by young Master Han. What? Royal God Call was already bored to death at this point. It was as if he had nothing to do with this battle at the moment. Running in accordance to coordinates was a simple task to the average players, yet this was literally the world's most difficult matter for someone like him who was geospatially challenged. The enemy team in the 3 o'clock direction has already entered the forest, Young Master Han said to him. Royal God Call lifted his head and took a look. Young Master Han was hidden amid the verdant trees, obscured by leaves and branches. The location up a tree was truly a wondrous concealment spot. Regrettably, the trees around here were thick and high, so Royal God Call found it impossible to climb up one without anyone giving him a lift from below. What should I do? Royal God Call asked. The surrounding forest was the most suitable terrain for the archer to survive, a job class that excelled in ambushing others. However, Royal God Call's poor sense of direction limited his ability to display the job class advantage here. Just how was it possible for someone without a great sense of direction to use the terrain effectively to deal with the enemy? If Royal God Call were to attempt this, let alone not knowing where the enemies were, it would even be possible for him to lose himself while making his way around the forest. Stand here. Turn right. MMM, that's good. Run straight in that direction. Young Master Han said. Okay. Royal God Call finally received Young Master Han's instruction. Securing his bow on his back, he ran in the direction Young Master Han had just indicated. Currently, the players of both teams were frantically making their moves all about this BVP arena. Chapter Notes 1. Power Extreme Centurion, a DC-inspired TV show from the late 1980s. Think of Power Rangers, 
but each with individual mech suit and unique weapon or power. Chapter 146, Raiding the Hilltop Young Master Han, who was currently standing atop the tall tree, felt quite pleased with himself as he watched everyone run like busy little ants all over this BVP arena. The eight teams of Cloud Herder mercenary group each went to the four corners and edges of this square-shaped map. One of the enemy teams reached Young Master's elite mercenary group's location at the zero, zero coordinates and stayed there without venturing further. Guys, update your coordinates to me. Young Master Han reminded everyone on the mercenary channel. Although he could see far from his vantage point, some parts, such as places behind hills, certain spots within the forests, and areas with uneven landscapes, still remained obscured from Young Master Han's field of view. All of his fellow mercenaries were currently hiding in such places as per his instructions, which resulted into him being unable to determine their exact locations. After the four reported their current coordinates, Young Master Han's mouth twitched, Royal, I gotta give credit where credit is due. May I ask, are you still running in a straight line? Of course, Royal God Call replied. If you continue running, I guarantee that you won't be able to get out of this forest, Young Master Han sighed. Royal, can you actually be this bad? Exactly how did you do your bounty mission all this while? Didn't those missions involve finding coordinates as well? Gufei asked. Royal's booklet of coordinates can't be used here. Brother Assist reminded him. Oh. Gufei finally made sense of everything. Royal God Call had a booklet containing a large amount of Yanjuan City's coordinates. Whenever he needed to head toward certain coordinates, he would check his booklet first, even if he failed to find the exact coordinates in it. He could at least flip to the page with the nearest set of coordinates that had landmarks jotted down beside it. An example landmark was Ray's Bar. Only by relying on these familiar locations could Royal God Call go to the corresponding coordinates. Maintain a clear channel. Don't chat here. Young Master Han chastised the two as he issued the next batch of orders. Sword Demon, wait for my signal to exit the forest and run to zero, 400 miles, once Sword Demon departs. Leave that back of the hill you're on and head toward the woodland at 366, 365 at your fastest speed. Brother Assist, from the lowland area you're in, there is a series of small knolls up ahead at 426, 375, right? Go there now. Over by the Cloud Herder Mercenary Group's side, Group Leader Phil Herder was also issuing commands while searching the nearby areas for their enemies with a small team. The people over by a vantage point, have you discovered anything or anyone yet? No. How about the other teams? We have arrived at the 7 clock position, nothing found. We are now at the 6 clock position, nothing found. The 8 teams of Cloud Herder Mercenary Group, besides the furthest team that that had run in the 1 o'clock direction, managed to reach their designated positions and reported their status back to Faux Herder. Everyone, get ready. Once the last team is at the 1 o'clock position, we will begin sweeping the map in a clockwise direction, Faux Herder sent this message. Unexpectedly, after sending out this command, a message arrived from one of the four scouts situated by a vantage point, a target located. A target located. Position. Target came from the forest at 11 o'clock. He's currently heading toward the 10 o'clock direction, the scout reported. Any average player could divide the map into various segments of a clock and estimate the direction of movement, but to tell the exact coordinates of each place just from sight alone required talent, just as young Master Han had previously said. Keep your eyes on him and update me of his movements. Team 2 and Team 3, which are nearest to the target, get over there for the kill. Fo Herder commanded. The four scouts kept track of Sword Demon once he revealed himself. Certain blind spots still existed even when they were on the high ground like this, so it was still possible to lose sight of a player if he or she dove into a land depression or hid behind a mound. Due to this fact, the four did not notice it when a lone figure sprinted from behind a hill on the other side of the map and instantly disappeared into a nearby patch of shrubberies. Sword Demon, that's enough. Stop where you are. Despite all these players looking no more than ants from young Master Han's vantage point, he could still distinguish friends from foes. Solitary figures were friends, whereas groups were enemies. He stopped. The scout reported. Position? Asked someone in one of the two teams that were preparing to intercept Sword Demon. Um. 
The scouts were briefly at a loss on how they should relay Sword Demon's position. If Sword Demon was in motion, they could say the clock direction he was heading to. Since Sword Demon was standing still, the scouts found it hard to describe his location. Position? The team member repeated his question. Um, take a turning to the left from where you guys are at. Further ahead, you'll catch sight of him. The other team needs to head slightly to the right. Ah, no. Veer a little more to the left. You guys have gone too far to the right. The team on the left, you got to go to the left some more. That team on the left still needs to move a little bit to the left. No. You've gone too far to the left now, move to the right once more. A bit more to the right. Just a bit more to the right. That's too much. A little to the left. Sigh. Your team is on the left too much. Head right. The two teams that were receiving these instructions real time finally had a breakdown at this point and yelled in unison, private message. Oh. The scouts finally realized what was causing the confusion, the four of them were all giving directions to the teams at the same time. Realizing this problem, the four scouts assigned one person to direct each team accordingly. Since Sword Demon had not moved all this while, their attention remained focused on him. When one of the scouts slightly blinked and looked at another direction, he spotted a figure speeding toward them. ARGH, I've spotted another enemy. The scout yelled, Where? Foe Herder quickly asked. He's heading straight to us. The other scouts yelled as well. Why are you all flustered, then? There are four of you. Aren't you guys prepared for an ambush? Foe Herder rebuked his underling's lack of composure. But he's so fast. The four scouts exclaimed as they hurriedly prepared themselves to engage the approaching person in combat. Fast? How fast can he be? Can he be faster than your arrows? Let's see how fast he can still be once his fleet foot is no longer in effect. Fo Herder said arrogantly. He had arranged for four archers to be their group's scouts precisely because they had the ability to attack targets from afar once they spotted one. The four archers knocked arrows on Snipe and waited for Gu Fei to enter their attack range to release them. As the target drew closer, his equipment became more discernible to the four and they all gasped in shock. He, he's not a thief on fleet foot. Then, what is he? He looks like a mage. Gu Fei's midnight spirit robe fluttered as he moved speedily toward these men, betraying his job class almost instantly. Only two job classes would wear robes, mage and priest. Since priest was a non-combat job class, it was impossible for one to rush toward them with tremendous killing intent. So why the hell are you four scared of him? You're all archers. Fo Herder cursed these particular underlings' incompetence once more. Not seeing it with his own eyes, he of course could never understand that there was a mage capable of having such monstrously fast movement speed. The four scouts' heads were currently filled with questions so they did not even bother looking at the messages on their mercenary channel. Seeing Gu Fei enter their attack range, one of the four archers shouted a command and they all simultaneously released their bowstrings. Four arrows streaked through the air like shooting stars. Gu Fei was brimming with confidence at this point. If his speed was still at level 30, he would obviously not be capable of dodging the four arrows on snipe that were currently flying toward him. After all, his in-game body did not possess the required movement speed and nimbleness to actively dodge the arrows back then despite him having the ability to see the arrow's trajectory. Right now, he was already at level 39. Although the archer's execution speed of skills had increased as well, it was still inferior to the increase Gu Fei had had with his 9 levels bonus stats all pumped into agility, as well as his Winchaser's boots movement speed buffs. Thus. Gu Fei did not even consider these average players' arrows on Snipe as a threat. The four scouts on the hilltop thought that the mage Gu Fei would be easily taken down by their concerted attacks. Instead, they saw him effortlessly dodge their four arrows and instantly close in on them. What? How is that possible? The four men exclaimed as their jaws dropped. Homing projectile. Let's quickly use homing projectile. Someone among the four archers cried out and they scrambled to knock their arrows. Their current strongest skill, Snipe, was still on cooldown time, so they could not fire off arrows on it at the moment. The need for archers to be deft at using their bows was a distinct drawback that reared its ugly head right now. If even Gu Fei, the supposed expert in hidden weapons, had to maintain his calmness, these archers would of course also need to do so. One of the four archers, who lacked mental fortitude, 
could not maintain his calmness in the face of Gu Fei's assault and subsequently failed to knock his arrow no matter how hard he tried. Fortunately, the other three archers possessed sufficient mental fortitude so they were able to initiate their attacks like normal. The twang of the bowstrings resounded as three glowing arrows flew toward Gu Fei. Since Gu Fei did not even see Snipes' speed as a threat, why would he be bothered by homing projectile? The skill's homing ability meant that a target could not dodge it. Yet Gu Fei did not even intend to dodge the arrows on homing projectile heading his way in the first place. Parrying with his moonlit nightfalls, he successfully knocked each of the three arrows off before they could deal any damage on him. The four scouts were so flabbergasted that their jaws were about to fall off. While they were still in a daze, Gu Fei already arrived before them. Twin Incineration Incinerate Gu Fei slashed with his blade. The archer job class also had inherently low HP. Barely managing to take on Gu Fei's one massive blow, two archers were insta-killed while the remaining two were at a loss on how to deal with Gu Fei. Gu Fei cared not for the two's confusion and merely sent a few slashes their way. Since they did not have the abilities to evade Gu Fei's strikes and to take him head on, the two archers decided to flee from their fight with him instead. Gu Fei was way faster than them. However, in just a few steps, he managed to close in on the two once more and dispose of them. None of the four scouts could make sense of anything even in their deaths. Is he really a mage? I seem to have heard him cast twin incineration, but could that mage spell really insta-kill people? Was I dreaming? After getting teleported out of the PvP arena upon their deaths, the four men bewilderedly stood in the plaza. The two teams designated to hunt for Sword Demon were still sending them messages, Position, 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 your ass. We are already dead. The four replied irately. Though Herdor was extremely nonplussed upon receiving this message from the four scouts. Just how much time had passed since they first reported seeing the target till they got killed? He finally realized that his four scouts were not exaggerating when they said that the target was so fast. Team 4 and Team 5, head toward the vantage point. Team 2 and Team 3. Have you lot located that target yet? Not yet. Young Master Han, who is still atop the tree, saw clearly how Gu Fei had stormed that hilltop and caused a series of white lights to flash afterward. Receiving Gu Fei's done message immediately after, he happily said, Very good, Miles. Head back to your previous hiding place. Sword Demon, dart toward 223, 398. Brother Assist, update me of your new coordinates. Royal. Are you out of the woods yet? Troublingly, young Master Han did not receive a response for that last message. Chapter 147, Incomprehensible This Is It, The Crucial Moment Young Master Han muttered to himself as he adjusted his position atop the tall tree to clearly monitor the Cloud Herder mercenary group's movements. Miles, head toward 118, 425. Sword Demon, turn toward 211. 301. Brother Assist, move toward 489, 101. Royal, hit me up when you finally exit the forest. Once more, no response came for that last statement. Gu Fei, Sword Demon, and Brother Assist were running all over the map, while Royal God Call was busying himself with getting lost inside the forest. Over by the Cloud Herder mercenary group's side. The group leader Fo Herder personally climbed up the hilltop that his men had once held the vantage point in his desire to see just how fast the mage was. Gu Fei's fast speed was indeed very eye-catching with all the players running about like ants in this map. Fo Herder was quite flabbergasted when he saw this. After all, Gu Fei's abnormally fast speed would only make sense if he were a thief or an archer who could attain such speed by wearing a pair of top grade boots and adding a lot of points toward agility. As for a mage, how many points to agility would it take to achieve such fast speed? A mage with great agility but low intelligence would be useless by then. So how did he kill off four archers in one go? Fo Herder quickly contacted the four scouts Gu Fei had eliminated moments ago. How did you guys die? He cut us down with a sword. I doubt that. That guy's a mage, so why would he cut you all with a sword? Fo Herder emphasized the word cut as he asked this question. We don't know either. The four had a really aggrieved expression on their faces right now, yet their group leader could naturally not see that through the mercenary channel. Did you lot use appraisal on him? Fo Herder pressed on. No. None of them managed to appraise Gu Fei. 
considering that they had barely fired off two rounds of arrows before Gu Fei was already upon them. Could he be a wolf in sheep's clothing, purposely wearing a robe to make others mistake him for a mage? As Fo Herdor was thinking of this, the four sent this message, but we did hear him chant twin incineration when he attacked us. A spell incantation doesn't necessarily have to be uttered by a mage, Fo Herdor said exasperatedly. But there was a fiery glow. The two men who had gotten burned by Gu Fei's spell insisted. There is this sort of thing called additional magic attack. Fo Herder ended the conversation with that statement, convinced that he had wholly figured out the conundrum. That guy is truly crafty, he must be a thief, Fo Herder thought to himself as he watched Gu Fei's print away. Standing high up on the hill, not only could Fo Herder see the general lay of the land, he had also become a highly prominent target. Gu Fei who was currently running on the PvP field had fond memories on that hilltop since it was the place that he had finished off the opposing scouts, and when he casually glanced over there again, he spotted Fo Herder that was standing up there. Gu Fei happily fired off a message on the mercenary channel, there is someone up that hill again. I saw already. Young Master Han replied. How should I rush over there? Gu Fei needed young Master Han's guidance for his assault route as he did not want to accidentally run into three or four teams along the way. Don't go there. From here onward, your only job is to run. No need to tangle with the enemies anymore, young Master Han instructed. What? Besides Gu Fei, Royal God Call and Brother Assist also exclaimed this when they heard young Master Han's words. Right now, we have four kill points while they have one kill point. No need for more kills since we are in the lead, young Master Han explained. But I have faith that I can eliminate them all with your instructions. Gu Fei argued confidently. If it was just the single eight-man team, Gu Fei could definitely wipe it out. In this manner, finishing off Cloud Herder's 60-plus members was doable with him alone. No need for that, just run. Why? Gu Fei was not resigned to this decision. They evidently had the strength to initiate attacks, so why did they have to act so cowardly? That's right. Why do we have to be sneaky when we can fight them? Royal God Call was discontented as well. He might have no sense of direction, but he still had his pride as an expert. Miles, change your direction to 234, 259, Royal God Call. A team has just entered the forest to search it. Note where you're hiding. Young Master Han actually ignored Royal God Calls and Gu Fei's objection. Awesome, I'll take care of them. Royal God Call declared. Although fighting in this sort of terrain for a geospatially challenged person like himself was hard, Royal God Call would rather struggle than be cowardly like Young Master Han. Brother Assist, move to 322, 145. Since Royal God Call was blatantly snubbing his instruction, Young Master Han also deliberately ignored his comment. Young Master, why are we dealing with them like this when, when we can kill them? Brother Assist was not rash like Royal God Call and chose to follow the instruction as he voiced his inner qualms. Brother Assist, can you not be so childish like them? Young Master Han asked instead. I just want to know the reason, we don't have time for that now, Sword Demon. Turn to 128. 278. Activate stealth if you meet anyone along the way. 30 seconds should be enough for you to shake them off, young Master Han said. Sword Demon uncomplainingly moved according to young Master Han's orders. Over by the Cloud Herder's mercenary channel, a pleasantly surprised cry sounded. We've found a target in the forest here. Deal with him. Team 1, head over to help, Fo Herder ordered as he instructed the other teams to block off the running two men's path of escape. Sadly, he did not possess young Master Han's talent to tell the coordinates from sight alone despite him being ranked 7th on the Warrior Experience leaderboard. When he gave directions, they were in the clock direction or relative direction format. Thus, his general instructions made it difficult for his group mates to complete the encirclement in time, especially since young Master Han, who had a clear view of everything, made the necessary adjustments at crucial moments. Moreover, Gu Fei and the rest moved about based on their judgment and would only alter their routes at young Master Han's advice. At this moment, 
the defiant royal god Kal had entered a tedious combat with the two teams inside the forest. Partaking in a fight inside a forest required him to change his position every shot he made. Royal God Kal fully understood this logic and quickly moved away after firing off his first arrow and hearing his enemies shout, Here, over here. However, he very quickly lost his bearings. Incessant cries of here, and over there, echoed about as Royal God Kal, who was hiding behind a tree, beaked his head out with one question in mind. Fuck, just where the hell was I moments ago? Stealing himself, he randomly chose a direction and ran out. He intended to locate another target and fire off his second arrow. Yet, he never expected to locate six targets at the same time, each of them shouting, over here. Although Royal God Call could still calmly shoot one more arrow at them, he noticed that his escape path had already been blocked by three of them. In an instant, spells, arrows and sneaky stabs came upon a royal god Call, who furiously struggled to defend himself. With a priest among the opposing team, his attacks were useless unless they insta-killed his targets. In the end, royal god Call turned into a beam of white light without managing to take one enemy down. Fuck! The irate royal god Call bellowed on the mercenary channel. The score was now four against two. The only ones left in the PvP arena among young masters elite mercenary group were Gufei. Brother Assist, Sword Demon, and Young Master Han. Before the rest could express their sorrow for Royal God Call's death, Brother Assist called out, I bumped into some enemies. With his slow movement speed and lack of fighting prowess, Brother Assist easily succumbed to his death following an opponent's exclamation of, There's another target over here. Young Master's elite mercenary group consecutively lost two members, bringing the score to four against three. Brother Assist was in the daze as he got teleported outside of the PvP arena. Royal God Call, who was beside him, was beating the wall in anguish. Coming back to his senses, Brother Assist sent out this message, We can't keep hiding like this. I did it on purpose, Young Master Han typed this confession. What? You meeting the opposing team after getting out of that low ground is because I directed you over to them, young Master Han explained. Gufei, Royal God Call, and War Without Wounds made a den when they saw his admission. You sent me to my death. On purpose? Brother Assist could not believe what he had just read. Just what are you trying to do? Royal God Call asked in frustration. Actually, he was the most dissatisfied out of all of them as he failed to contribute anything to the PvP match due to his poor sense of direction. When he tried to engage the enemies, he was instead easily taken down by them. How was this outcome befitting an expert like him? Don't be very dramatic. If you knew that I also directed you to the forest on purpose, you would be angry as well, right? Young Master Han asked. The hell did you say? Royal God Call indeed became angry. Just what is going on? Gufei asked as he stopped running around the map. Just keep running like I told you, young Master Han said to Gufei. Gufei mulishly chose to turn back, issuing an order to young Master Han instead, I'll get rid of that commanding guy on that hill. We can kill the rest after. Update me the coordinates of the opposing group's eight teams. Miles, this is why I idolize you. Go, avenge me and kill them all. Royal God Call hated that the mercenary channel could not display the resentment he was feeling right now. Inside the PvP arena, Gufei pulled up Moonlit Nightfalls and sprinted back to the small hill before. With his superiorly fast speed that can allow him to escape danger, he was not afraid of encountering the eight teams at the same time. Meanwhile, Fo Herder saw Gufei suddenly change direction and head toward his location atop this hill. He is coming back here? With a faint smile on Phil Herder's face, he pulled out his claymore and planted it to the ground. He grandly posed as he regarded Gufei with insolence. As the seventh rank warrior on the experience leaderboard, he did not fear dueling with anyone. Oh, there's another one. As Phil Herder was staring intently at Gufei, he saw another figure heading toward him from his peripheral vision. There's movement by the foot of the hill where I am at. Two players are heading my way fast. Kill them and we will win this PvP match in terms of kill points. Phil Herder issued this order. Chapter 148 to 6 against 4 Gufei was happily running toward the hilltop when he noticed that there was someone beside him who was heading in the same direction. Turning his head to look, he saw that it was Sword Demon. Hey! He pointed his sword to Sword Demon as a form of greeting and said, Let's go kill him. Listen. 
Sword Demon blocked Gu Fei's advance. What? We'll likely head straight into an ambush if we rush to them like this. Sword Demon replied, that's perfect, saves us the time to find them, we can kill all the enemies in one go. Gu Fei was currently experiencing an adrenaline rush and carelessly thought that all sorts of PvP maneuvers were useless before his absolute strength. Calm down, I know your attack power is high, but can you really face over 10 enemies at once? Sword Demon rationalized, if you shield me for a bit. Gu Fei began to say, thinking of his coordination with Svelte Dancer yesterday. I may be able to shield you once, but there won't be a second time, Sword Demon frankly said, gesturing around them, he added, take a look. Planes surrounded them, so they could immediately see the many teams of Cloud Herder mercenary group heading their way from various directions. Furthermore, Fo Herdor was now provocatively pointing his claymore toward Gu Fei and Sword Demon. Even if they rushed up the hill and eliminated Fo Herdor, they would end up getting surrounded by the other members afterward. Uncaringly, Gu Fei lifted his moonlit nightfalls and accepted Fo Herdor's taunt. We'll kill as many as we can. With that, he continued his charge up the hill. Sword Demon tried to block Gu Fei once more, yet his speed was no match for the latter. Despite being a thief, Sword Demon's boots were not top grade. He knew that he would not catch up to Gu Fei even if he activated his fleet foot, so he could only helplessly follow him from behind. Fo Herder remained unfazed when he saw that the two men had continued their charge toward him. With the enemies just three meters away from him, Fo Herder parted his two hands holding a claymore reach and placed them on both sides of his body. Dual wielder. He already went for his job class advancement as a berserker. Be careful. Sword Demon shouted after Gu Fei. When a level 40 warrior advanced to a berserker, the first skill he or she would learn was dual wielding mastery, which would allow him or her to dual wield weapons. Nonetheless, equipping weapons on a dominant hand and a non dominant hand had some differences. While no changes would occur to the weapon that was equipped on the dominant hand, equipping a weapon on the non dominant hand would only allow a player to access 20% of the weapon's attack power. This percentage would only increase when the respective mastery for the skill reached a higher rank. This skill was similar to Gu Fei's spell mastery so players did not need to grind its proficiency. As long as they reached the appropriate level, they could level up the skill's rank from the relevant NPC over by the warrior encampment. Fo Herdor was at level 40 and he had a non-dominant left hand. Therefore, the sword in his left hand could only unleash 20% of its attack power. However, the dual wielding mastery skill affected not just this. Cyclone Although Fo Herder's current posture of hanging his claymores by his two sides was different to a warrior's regular stance when unleashing Cyclone, Gu Fei could still tell his intention just from seeing half his body's posing. What surprised Gu Fei was not the fact that a warrior had activated this skill during a PvP. Instead, it was the fact that Fo Herder had activated the skill early. Having fought with warriors many times, Gu Fei no longer needed to take a defensive stance against it. Using his fast speed and high damage output advantages, he managed to insta-kill many opponents in the past just by guessing when they would start their attacks. At this moment, however, Fo Herder activated his cyclone about 3 meters away, a distance Gu Fei had no means of attacking the other. This small detail already decided the gap between an expert and an average player. Many warriors could not use cyclone against Gu Fei. Yet Fo Herder's cyclone was even starting to spin. The change that dual wielding mastery brought could directly be seen through this cyclone alone. The speed of cyclone produced by two claymores being held parallel to the ground was fiercer and gustier than the speed of regular cyclone. Players had long noticed this aspect of the skill and they had of course tried using both hands to unleash cyclone before but they ended up returning to using single weapons to perform the skill when they realized that their offhand weapons did not generate any attack power. Putting this aside, there was also a possibility that a warrior might unluckily push his or her opponent outside the cyclone's attack range with their offhand weapons. As a corollary, the attack from the dominant hand would get wasted. At present, with the non-dominant hand finally able to generate attack power, this cyclone was able to display the advantages of dual wielding weapons. Gu Fei's pupils contracted. He could tell at a glance that this doubly fast cyclone was not something he could block. Nonetheless, 
Gu Fei still positioned his sword before him as he knew that doing something was better than just waiting for his death. And what awaited him was extreme pain. The sword met the claimers and, as Gu Fei had expected, fell to block Cyclone. Grating against his body, Fo Herder's Cyclone successfully flung Gu Fei outward with a whoosh. Sword Demon chased after Gu Fei's flying figure and cushioned the latter's fall by positioning himself behind Gu Fei. I'm alive. Gu Fei gasped in astonishment as he stood up. His left hand holding a claymore only dealt 20% damage, Sword Demon told Gu Fei. Having known Gu Fei for quite some time, his fellow mercenaries wholly understood that Gu Fei did not spend much time researching about the game's mechanics like them. Gu Fei sighed in relief. Although he was not that knowledgeable of the game's mechanics, he at least had an understanding of this sort of concepts after playing Parallel World for over a month. It would indeed be an overkill if just 20% of a warrior's attack power could insta-kill someone. However, the two did not have the time to ponder about this matter for long since a fiery glow began to emerge right above their heads, the ground beneath their feet became warmer, and the piercing sound of objects traveling through air echoed about. Quickly dodge! The duo simultaneously shouted as they bolted away. Descending wheel of flames, blazing three of a thousand inferno, double shot, homing projectile. The opposing teams that that had gotten into firing range of Gu Fei and Sword Demon began unleashing their long range attacks on the two. Although the two managed to dodge the first wave, the second wave was already upon them. The next batch of flame wheels appeared above them. The Olympic rings of descending wheel of flames that Gu Fei had previously disdained effectively widened the spell's current tail. Relying purely on his extremely fast movement speed, Gu Fei barely dodged the flame wheels. Sword Demon was not as lucky, though, and one flame wheel managed to hit him full force. Thankfully, the average mages did not have Gu Fei's or Drifting's high spell damage, so that one flame wheel failed to insta kill Sword Demon. He was still ablaze when he ran after Gu Fei. We can't continue like this, let's split up. Rush out of the encirclement from the 156, 217 direction, Sword Demon said as he activated Fleet Foot and headed toward a different direction. As another flame wheel began to form above Gu Fei's head, he quickly ran for his life. He used Descending Wheel of Flames to insta kill many players before. Yet he was currently being forced to flee by this very same spell. Was this what others meant by retribution? Gu Fei ran onward as he took note of the flame wheel's progress above his head. After a bit, he could only sigh, I'm finished. Two flames wheels had already appeared to where Gu Fei was heading. By the time he ran to that area in front, the flames wheels had begun their descent to the ground. Although the two spells could not insta-kill him, Gu Fei's HP was currently not full so the current magic assault would mostly likely kill him. This was what facing an expert mercenary group meant. Gu Fei was not the only one who could calculate in advance where a spell would hit. Since the opponents currently had more manpower, their coordinated strikes managed to include the most conservative as well as the most extreme estimation of Gu Fei's possible movement, covering all the routes he would likely take. How depressing! Gu Fei thought of Royal God Call's look of anticipation when he asked him to avenge their deaths. And yet, here he was, about to die in an even more embarrassing manner than them. Knowing that the flame wheels would hit him, Gu Fei raced forward as he fervently hoped that his remaining HP would be able to survive the spell's damage output. He kept on running as he waited for the system to announce his fate, yet no further movement occurred above his head. Unexpectedly. Gu Fei managed to escape the spell Zeo with his mat's print. Glancing backward, he felt stunned by what he saw. Sword Demon on Fleet Foot did not break out of the encirclement, instead, he bore the brunt of descending wheel of flames and charged toward the pack of mages, eliminating two mages with his practiced footwork and skill in a split second. The flame wheels above Gu Fei dissipated because Sword Demon had forcefully interrupted with his assault the mages' spell casting. With the mages scattering about to dodge the still burning thief's attack, the archers behind them sent forth the cloud of arrows toward Sword Demon. Given how tightly knitted the arrows were, Sword Demon naturally failed to escape the bombardment and subsequently turned into a beam of white light. Listen to young master's orders. Sword Demon sent this private message to Gu Fei right before he disappeared. Gu Fei froze in place for a bit. Checking the mercenary channel, he saw that young master Han had sent out this message, head toward 164, 189.
Gu Fei did not think more about it and just headed toward the indicated direction. 174, 201. 189, 176. 201, 176. Messages incessantly flashed on the mercenary channel as young Master Han constantly sent Gu Fei a fresh batch of coordinates allowing the latter to move forward without getting hit by any of the enemy's attacks. As Gu Fei left the chasing players further and further behind, the players in front of him tried to block off his path of escape. Unfortunately for them, the route young Master Han had guided Gu Fei to allow the latter to escape them unscathed. Fo Herder, who remained atop the hill, watched Gu Fei's movement and found it to be very perplexing. The route Gu Fei had taken completely avoided any form of obstructions or any incoming mercenaries from Fo Herder's side. It would be understandable for Gu Fei to successfully avoid all of them if they were in an open plain where everyone's location was visible. Presently, however, they were attempting to intercept Gu Fei from places he should not be aware of. And yet, he was still able to successfully circle past them. This, there must be someone giving him directions. Actually, the first thought that came to Fo Herder was, there's a spy. He suspected that the instructions he had sent on the mercenary channel were being revealed by a spy to the enemies. However, he very quickly dismissed this theory. If that was really the case, why would the two previously risk their lives to rush up the hill to kill him? A breeze swept through the hilltop from a nearby forest. Fo Herder suddenly looked at the hill across him. Although that hill was not as high as this hill he was on, that place was well covered by tall trees. If someone was atop a tree, although the field of view over there could not match his current position, commanding from over there with an overview of this map's terrain would not be difficult. So that's how it is. Fo Herder was delighted with his discovery and he immediately sent a command, Team 3 and Team 7. Head over to that hill within the forest near you. An enemy should be hiding atop a tree over there. Hurry! Receiving this order, Team 3 and Team 7 promptly made their way toward the hill by the forest. Young Master Han, who was atop the tree, saw the two teams heading his direction as he continued to direct Gu Fei. Oh, so you finally found out. He muttered to himself. The score right now was 6 against 4. An imperfect ending after receiving the order from Fo Herder. The two teams of Cloud Herder mercenary group headed straight to the hill within the forest. Finding a hidden person among the dense leaves and branches in the verdant forest was not easy, but none of them gave up searching, even making the archers and mages climb up the trees, since Fo Herder was certain that someone was hiding somewhere on this hill. Young Master Han remained unfazed by what was happening around him and merely continued monitoring Gu Fei who was currently trying to avoid being spotted by the other six enemy teams. Giving another set of instructions, he finally sighed, your current position is a blind spot for that hill. Also, I want you to remember these few places. Young Master Han quickly sent him a few more coordinates and said, move sequentially through these coordinates, they should help you for a while but everything will be up to you after that. Pausing for a bit, he said almost to himself, there are still 11 minutes left. Hang in there. What's the matter? Gu Fei gleaned from young Master Han's tone of voice, which resembled someone relaying their last will, that something was not right. I've been discovered. But don't worry, we will still be in the lead with 6 against 5 kill points even if I get killed. You just have to survive these 11 minutes. Young Master Han replied in earnest. In his peripheral vision, he could see that two archers had already climbed up the nearby trees and were now looking all around them. Over there, one of the two archers spotted young Master Han and quickly indicated his location to the rest of the search team. Run. Keep running and take advantage of your speed. Definitely do not engage them. As young Master Han finished saying this. A ball of fire and an arrow hurtled through the air toward him. Despite young Master Han's amazing skills as a priest, his HP was really low. This was due to his unique way of adding points that was unlike the other priests who would focus on an endurance build. Thus, young Master Han was only able to endure two volleys of the enemy's concerted attacks before he turned into a stream of white light. The score changed once more to six against five. Victory and loss now obviously lay in that final kill point. Fo Herdor was very much willing to sacrifice all his troops for this final kill point from their last opponent since it would mean the elimination of the entire young master's elite mercenary group. 
though hurt her side. It was no wonder that all his attempts to surround the mage earlier had been met with failure. He had originally thought that it was due to his instructions being vague, which resulted into his teams being unable to properly encircle the mage. He should have suspected earlier that someone on the opposing side was secretly giving the mage directions. Fauherter was a little frustrated, but he felt better knowing that there was only one opponent to deal with in these final ten minutes. Fauherter lost sight of the mage's figure after the latter went over a small knoll in a distance. Nonetheless, determining which way the opponent had gone to was easy. With this thought in mind, Fo Herder quickly directed his men to head over the small knoll. Team 4 and Team 5, circle around that knoll from the left. Team 1 and Team 2, take the right. Team 6 and Team 8, head over the knoll as well. Team 3 and Team 7, head toward the forest in the 4 o'clock direction. Fo Herder sent out these commands as he assured himself, there shouldn't be any further problems this time. While he was daydreaming of success. The figure clad in black robe suddenly appeared at the top of the knoll after clearly going past it a short while ago. That guy's at the top of the knoll. Surround the whole knoll. Fo Herder immediately ordered, Roger. All the members replied. Gufay, who was standing atop the mound, was visible not only to Fo Herder but to every enemy spreading and surrounding the knoll in its entirety as well. Listen to young master's directions. The final words Sword Demon had left Gufay as he sacrificed his life for the latter rang in his ears at this moment. Since that's the case, gripping Moonlit Knight falls in his hand, Gufay told himself firmly, This sword is not a weapon to slay people, right now, it is a booster that will provide me additional 20 points to agility for my goal to evade the enemies. Waving to everyone approaching the mound, Gufay retreated through the knoll's other side and began his math sprint for freedom. The coordinates that young Master Han had provided him were clearly displayed on the mercenary channel. The first one, Gufay muttered to himself as ran toward the first set of coordinates. Although both sides of the knoll were already surrounded by the Cloud Herder mercenary group's men, they were unfortunately a lot slower than Gufay. The opposing group's four fastest archers failed to block Gufay in time so they proceeded to fire off arrows on homing projectile toward him. Four arrows on homing projectile flew toward Gufay. Holding Moonlit Night Falls with one hand, he fished out sacred flames of baptism with his other hand. He looked backward to take note of the distance of the arrows to him. When the timing was right, he suddenly pirouetted and knocked off the four arrows hot on his heels with his swords. The attacks hampered Gufay's speed and allowed the enemies to close the distance with him by quite a bit. Sadly. All skills had cooled down time, so the four archers could temporarily not shoot arrows on homing projectile. When they fired off arrows on snipe instead, Gufay easily shook them off with a few change of directions. The four archers were extremely regretful at this point, they would not have used homing projectile altogether had they known that this would happen. They should have taken turns in interfering with Gufay's progress which would allow them to catch up to him eventually. Who would have thought that it was possible to knock off four arrows on homing projectile like that, anyway? When the four shot out their arrows, they had already assumed that Gufay would be a goner for sure. It was too late for regrets now, as Gufay had already left them in the dust. Those with slower speed, such as the warriors and priests, did not even consider chasing after the mage who had insanely fast speed. In just a short while, Gufay had gotten out of the encirclement and left everyone far behind. Fo Herder knew that things were going south when he saw Gufay successfully evade his men's pursuit. Given the mage's monstrously fast speed, it was impossible for Cloud Herder mercenary group to form any sort of encirclement to deal with him. In closing and capturing Gufay with his speed would require Fo Herder to set up a net across a wide area and to limit his space gradually. Their attempted encirclement just then was akin to letting a bird leave its cage or a fish to get out of the fishing net and return into the sea, trying to encircle him again. Would ten minutes be enough? No. Only nine minutes were left now. Fo Herder's forehead began to sweat profusely. He no longer dared to deploy his men so casually like before. While attempting to get a read of Gufay's destination, he quickly organized his mercenaries into new groups based on their speed. The slower teams would exert pressure from the front to cut off all possible retreats for Gufay. Meanwhile, the faster teams would close in from the sides in a wing-like formation. The goal this time was to enclose and keep Gufay in a huge pocket. Unexpectedly, 
Gu Fei had rushed out of one segment of the enclosing wing and suddenly veered off into another direction. This one move of Gu Fei instantly caused the two wing formation to fail forming the pocket that Fo Herder had just strategized. How is this possible? Can there still be someone secretly guiding him? Fo Herder exclaimed in his astonishment. However, the score that the system had calculated was irrefutable. There really was only one person left in the opposing mercenary group at this point. Fo Herder tried forming a new formation again, but just as his fresh plan was about to succeed, Gu Fei had once more unpredictably changed his direction. Fo Herder was now utterly flabbergasted. He was clearly doing the entrapment, yet he could not help but feel that he was the one being entrapped by an even bigger net. He would have to change his tactics in order to shed himself off of this unseen, bigger net and to properly entrap Gu Fei. While it was possible for him to come up with a new plan to force Gu Fei into a corner, he simply did not have time to do so at the moment. After all, there were only six minutes left until this match's end. The entire mercenary group is in a mess right now. Originally, none of these men thought that this six-man mercenary group was worth their attention or time. All of them thought that this round would be the same as yesterday's match where they could easily tour about the PvP arena and leave it with a perfect score. And yet, the unexpected happened and they were now in such a disheartening situation. The opponent only had to survive these six minutes and his group would achieve victory. No, that was not right either, as only five minutes were left now. Gu Fei took note of his surroundings as he ran and spotted a few heads occasionally popping up here and there. Someone was still standing atop that faraway hill. He reckoned that the person was the berserker from before. Gu Fei restrained himself from rushing over to exchange blows with the berserker and continued to rigidly follow the path that young Master Han had set for him through the series of coordinates. Although he still felt dissatisfied with young Master Han's method of doing things, he decided to heed Sword Demon's words and curbed his desire to PvP. Time slipped by. Gu Fei finished running young Master Han's coordinates with only two minutes left to the PvP match. At the moment, he found himself atop a small hill with the members of Cloud Herder mercenary group heading in his direction in a disorderly fashion. Gu Fei felt somewhat anxious. With only two minutes left, he did not wish to risk their win by rushing toward the enemies and meeting a similar fate to his dead comrades. That would be too much of a disappointment, after all. If it were just him alone, he would long revel in slaughtering the enemies, consequences be damned. But right now, the fate of the mercenary group was heavily resting upon his shoulders. Fuck, did I fall for young master's tricks yet again? Gu Fei thought to himself as he ran toward a direction where no enemy was visible. 1 minute, 30 seconds, 10 seconds. Fo Herder finally sat down on the ground in dejection. We lost. But it's such an unmerited loss. All the Cloud Herder's members bellowed helplessly as they were sent out of the PvP arena. With this, the second round of the Mercenary PvP tournament was concluded. Young Masters Elite Mercenary Group eliminated Cloud Herder Mercenary Group with a score of 6 against 5. Where are they? Where the hell are those cowards from Young Masters Elite? Beyond the teleportation array outside the Hall of Mercenaries, the Cloud Herder's members gathered together and incessantly cursed up and down the street trying to find the members of the mercenary group that they had just lost to. When he exited the teleportation array, Gu Fei was immediately dragged off by Sword Demon to a secluded corner, where the other members of Young Master's Elite were huddling. With curses reverberating everywhere, they, especially Royal God Call, could not help but show a distasteful expression on their faces. Young Master Han listened for a while before shaking his head and saying, the tactics we have used this time are still imperfect. We should have covered our faces during the match just now. Everyone remained silent for a good while in the face of his statement. Fuck, how can this still be considered a win? Royal God Call was the first to explode, resentfully saying, With your command and coordination with Miles, we totally had the ability to take them down. Why did we have to fight them like that? Although they won, the way they had achieved it was neither beautiful nor satisfactory. Cloud Herder mercenary group's unending curses were a testament to this fact. Young Master Han smiled coldly before replying, Our goal is to win this whole mercenary PvP tournament. To do that, we have to rely on a battle strategy that affects the outcome of everything instead of depending on tactics that can only win us one match. Royal God Call was taken aback, what strategy? You'll find out very soon. 
young Master Han answered mysteriously, fleeing about until the time runs out is not the least bit challenging. Royal God Call cried indignantly, challenging, why don't you eat ice cream in a blizzard or take a piss in a rising gale? That's very challenging, young Master Han remarked dryly, what do you mean by that? Royal God Call angrily yelled, a meaningful inning or a meaningless challenge, which will you choose? Young Master Han asked, there are some challenges themselves which are very meaningful to me. Gu Fei suddenly interjected, Chapter 150 forever in flowers Gu Fei's words left young Master Han inexplicably stunned. His pure intention of using Kung Fu brought him to parallel world, so his way of thinking somewhat differed from the other players. As such, young Master Han was momentarily left speechless by his words. Alright, let's speak more of this tomorrow. Don't you four still have the Guild vs Guild tournament to take care of? Brother Assist addressed Gu Fei and the other three men who were part of other guilds, nodding their heads. The four quietly departed toward the same location. Intuitively, the four separated from one another as if they were strangers along the way. Only Brother Assist and Sword Demon were left by the, the square outside the Hall of Mercenaries. Brother Assist wiped the sweat off his brows as he peeked out of the corner that they were in. Let's quickly leave as well. Cloud Herder's men are almost on us. Sword Demon smiled slightly. I'm not afraid of them, I can use stealth. Brother Assist paused. Patting Sword Demon's arm as he laughed bitterly, Oh, you. Despite what was just said between the two, they still took a detour to sneak past Cloud Herder. Since Young Master's Elite's members came face to face with Cloud Herder's members just a while ago, it was highly likely for them to recognize the six men. This sort of tournaments usually placed everyone on an equal playing field with no death penalty so very few people would hold grudges. As for those few people who would bear hatred against others in such fair fights, they more often than not had tyrannical, unprincipled, and other negative personalities. In the Cloud Herders members' case, it was their extreme unwillingness to admit defeat that bred this heavy grudge against Young Master's elite. Sword Demon and Brother Assist went a big round before finally leaving the square outside the Hall of Mercenaries. Shall we head to the bar? Brother Assist suggested. Sword Demon did not say no to his suggestion, so the two made their way toward Ray's bar. Their usual room was taken, so they occupied a different room. Today's match led to a bit of disharmony within our group. Brother Assist began to speak about the matter once he sat down. Sword Demon smiled bitterly. It was not just a bit of disharmony, in fact, it was no exaggeration to say that this event could even lead to the disbandment of their mercenary group. Fortunately, Everyone had been through thick and thin since Parallel Worlds opened beta days. Although they had not done many things together, spending time every day at Ray's bar with one another at least fostered a strong bond among them all. Moreover, they did not lose in this match, so the situation did not escalate too much. More importantly, everyone had a pretty good grasp of young Master Han's personality after knowing him for quite a while. With their great mental resilience, they could one way or another tolerate young Master Han's illogical approach to today's PvP match. If this was how they had done their first mercenary mission together, Sword Demon believed that Royal God Call would have left without a word and Gu Fei would have slain young Master Han on the spot. That man was a seriously violent person. Gu Fei's high park value in his days of slaying people for bounty mission had left a deep impression on everyone in the mercenary group. How much do you understand of young Master's intention for employing such a PvP tactic? Brother Assist asked. Sword Demon had been young Master Han's online partner for so many years already. Even if he did not have young Master Han's mind for tactics, Sword Demon at least had a better idea of his intention than others. Interpersonal trust was built up through mutual understanding, after all, even in an online game, it would be virtually impossible to partner with someone that a person did not trust or understand. Sword Demon thought for a moment before saying, he must have planned out today's tactic as he entered the preparation map only deciding to set his plan in motion after confirming the opposing group's head count. Brother Assist was astonished, that's only several minutes before the match began. Yes, he probably had several different ideas from the start, but when it was time to begin the match, he chose to carry on with the plan to achieve a victory without finishing off every opponent's. However, an accident happened at the beginning, Sword Demon said. Accident? Wounds did not manage to eliminate any opponents, 
causing us to fall behind on kill points. That's something he must not have expected, Sword Demon explained, continuing. But, it's very common for unexpected accidents to happen while plans are underway. As long as adjustments are done in time, the main strategy will still be used. From today's method of assault, he clearly intended to achieve this sort of victory. This sort of victory. Brother Assist seemed to have understood something. More people were gathered at the plaza outside the main hall of guilds and at the square outside the hall of mercenaries. All players queued with their guild leaders to enter the teleportation portal in an orderly fashion. On his way over, Gufei was pondering on something. If Amethyst Rebirth were to meet a guild as cohesive as Cloud Herder mercenary group, victory would not be achieved with just my felt dancer's efforts. If that time ever comes. Should I kill for the fun of it or deal with the enemies as best as I can while considering the guild's benefit in mind? At this moment, this saying entered his mind, with great power, comes great responsibility. This adage had essentially been vetoed by his father in reality. Even when he already possessed great skills, his father did not allow him to take on some noble calling, such as protecting world peace. This made him feel absolutely helpless. And now he had to resort to playing Superman in this online game. Sigh. As Gufei was thinking of all this, he had unknowingly walked through the teleportation array and was instantly teleported into the changing room. Hi. Gufei greeted everyone. The ladies had arrived earlier than him as usual. However, the ladies' mood today seemed to be very different from yesterday's jocular banter. Not only were all the ladies present, all of them wore a serious expression on their faces as well. Could it be that Mayans felt Dancer's indomitable performance yesterday made all these ladies gain a bit of bravery through shame, and they decided to seriously fight the PvP matches from now on, too? Gufei asked to himself. Miles, you're here. July welcomed Gufei. Yup. How was your mercenary PvP match today? She politely asked. This way of greeting the others had started trending in parallel world ever since the PvP tournament event began. Asking how was your guild match before a mercenary PvP tournament and how was your mercenary PvP match before a guild versus guild tournament was was now a common act that everyone in game performed. Close when, Gufei smiled tightly. Congrats, July said. With that. She clapped her hands to get the ladies' attention and introduce their opposing guild for today's guild match. Gufei listened and slowly understood why everyone seemed to have brought out their fighting spirit today. Today's opposing guild for Amethyst Rebirth was called Forever in Flowers. It was a level 1 guild with 50 members. The problem was that this guild was established by a bunch of male players who were notorious philanderers. It was unknown if the system purposely matched up a guild filled with lewd men with a guild filled with pure ladies. July looked up some information about their current matchup from the system and was left in utter rage when she read the opposing guild's lecherous motto. Briefing everyone about the current opponents upon her return, all the ladies' will to fight was instantly kindled. Now that she was explaining the matter in greater detail, the ladies were even more agitated. Everyone promptly condemned that bunch of lectures to the seventh hell. Their words kept flowing non-stop as they slowly began to include not just the 50 lectures of forever in flowers but the entire male species as well in their verbal condemnations. When their condemnation even reached all the way to the photo scandal that that had happened to a certain popular male artist at the start of the year in reality. July clapped her hands to draw all the ladies' attention once more. All focused their gazes at her, thinking that she was about to express a unique view on this matter. July said, there are still three minutes until the match begins, all should make their preparations. It was indeed a unique view. Gufei believed that all the ladies here had long forgotten what they were supposed to be doing here besides July. Amazing. Gufei could not help but think, our current meeting before the battle is filled with unity. Despite the tension, it does not lack solemnity or liveliness as well. Today, I must kill more than you. HMPH. Just as everyone was about to enter the PvP arena, Svelte Dancer said this to Gufei. The Amethyst Rebirths ladies saw a different scenery when they finally arrived at the real PvP arena. My fellow sisters, let's go. Someone yelled. All the ladies showed their determination by echoing this battle cry. Gufei kept his mouth shut this whole time, as he did not agree with that my fellow sister's call with him being a brother. Charge. With a bellow, all the ladies dashed forward. In the blink of an eye, Svelte Dancer disappeared out of sight, 
and he was left behind with the priests and warriors once more. What's so different here than what happened yesterday? Gufe was irate. Once more, he matched his pace with the priests and warriors. Luo Luo, who was beside him, also had a severe expression on her face today and did not teasingly bestow heel onto Gufe like usual, instead, she asked him intently, Miles, why aren't you charging onward? When Gu Fei did not reply, she asked, Do you need me to add fuel to your fire? Lifting her staff, she acted as if she would bestow heel onto him, so he quickly ran after Svelte Dancer. Svelte Dancer was bellicose. Wanting to seize the initiative from Gu Fei, she pushed her limits and sprinted straight toward the opposing guild spawn point. However, she found no one around when she arrived there. Circling the area twice, Svelte Dancer still found no one. She roared in her impotent rage, where's everyone? Get out of here. Babe, over here. Someone actually answered. Svelte Dancer turned her head fast toward the voice's origin and spotted a few men by a small knoll making funny faces at her. Without hesitation, she bounded toward them. With their mouths drooling, they stuttered their admiration for the pretty lady before them. Ah, ah. This went on for quite some time before someone among these men finally said, God damn, this babe is too fierce. Let's run. These men finally felt terrified when they saw how Svelte Dancer had managed to cover half the distance in a split second. The men stood up in unison from atop the knoll and ran in five different directions. Svelte Dancer paused for a moment when she got on top of the knoll. Helpless, she casually chose a target to chase. However, she ran no more than a few steps when she saw a figure clad in black robe opposite her hurtling himself over to kill the targets. Svelte Dancer found this figure to be very familiar. She quickly hollered, Don't you dare, that is mine. Her scream arrived too late, though. The man clad in black robe caught up to her target and, with a lift of his arm, turned the target into a stream of white light. What's the situation? Gufe asked about the status of the PvP match as he ran towards Svelte Dancer. You're not allowed to steal my kills again. Svelte Dancer clutched Gufe's arms and shook him. Don't mess around. There are 49 more people out there. Gufe did not know whether to laugh or cry at her pettiness, so he just pointed her toward a direction. There are men hiding inside that forest. You think you can trick me with that? Svelte Dancer spat those words with vitriol as she turned to chase after the other four men who had previously dispersed. Sigh. To think my kindness would be mistaken for trickery. With that, Gufe entered the forest he had indicated to Svelte Dancer himself. Stop hiding and come out already. Gufe knocked upon the tree trunks as he shouted hoarsely. Drunk bro. Drunk bro. Over here. Someone suddenly called. Gufe followed the voice in shock. Fireball. A ball of fire formed on his palm just as he reflexively said this word, Bla- Gufe quickly spat to extinguish the ball of fire in his hand, asking as he stared at the mousy fireball hiding behind a tree, Why are you here? This is my guild. Fireball replied, Forever in flowers? Gufe asked, That's right. Fireball nodded his head vigorously. Gufe suddenly felt guilty. Fireball could be considered as the first friend he had made in Parallel World. Yet he did not even know which guild he belonged to, showing how little he cared for his fire bro. That was when Fireball suddenly kicked a few trees around him. Get the fuck out of here and meet him. There's no need for me to tell you guys how awesome Junk Bro is, right? Five other men, with eyes teeming in admiration for Gufe, appeared from behind the trees. They regarded him like a god even as they called out to him in the same way Fireball had done, Junk Bro. And Gufe did not know how to respond to this. They were supposed to be enemies, yet they actually treated him as if he was one of their own with Fireball taking the lead. How could Gufe kill them at this rate? Drunk bro, how did you get into Amethyst Rebirth? Please teach these fellow brothers. Someone pleaded while gazing at Gufe expectantly. Now that he knew why they idolized him so much, Gufe could feel beads of sweat forming on his forehead. He steadied himself before answering, It's all a misunderstanding. He then began to tell them about Zizi Ocean tricking him in the past. Although they have the number now, they decided not to kick me out of the guild once we all became more familiar with one another. That is how I managed to stay there till now. Gufe concluded. Ah, why am I not lucky like you? A few of them lamented as they beat their chests in sadness. Gufe was once more left speechless. 
Fireball suddenly became alert as he hushed everyone, quiet, another babe is here. These men quickly ducked back behind the trees, including Fireball. Seeing Goofy standing there dumb as a doornail, Fireball quickly called out to him, Drunk bro, over here. He pulled Goofy over and shared a tree with him. Hiding behind the tree with Fireball, Goofy saw July, Willow, and a few archers and thieves rushing to the clearing within the trees. Ah, that slender babe isn't bad, someone said, pointing to Willow. That one is not bad. Two, she is a fighter, I think. That was July. Drunk bro, be careful. Don't let them see you. Fireball felt that Goofy was a little too bold with his sneaking, so he gave the latter this advice out of concern for him. Goofy was in tears as this situation unfolded before him. Fucking hell, just what am I doing exactly? 